Hey everyone, this is James Lindsay. You're listening to the New Discourses podcast, and it's time to talk about Marxism. We're actually going to read quite a bit of Marx. Today we're going to talk about a concept from Marx called the negation of the negation. We're also going to talk about the concept of succession, which I'm not a thousand percent clear on if succession refers to the negation or to the negation of the negation, but at any rate, there's this weird terminology that we're going to try to make some sense of, and we're going to try to make sense of the world that we live in through this terminology. Unfortunately, as we're going to hear, I think that it, we're going to uncover, or I'm about to tell you, that I've seen uh, pretty clearly in Capital, which is, of course, Marx's infamous Das Kapital, uh, that um, what is being attempted in China with their model, which is the Deng Xiaoping theory model that we'll talk a little bit more about, and what is being attempted in the West using ESG to create effectively the same model, but with some slight, uh, we'll call them regional variations uh, for for the purposes of this, um, is actually there in capital as the kind of correct direction to go if you wanted to establish a global communism. Now, I don't think Marx is right about this going, being something that will work, but I do think that um, when the critics out there say, you know, that what we're looking at in the world today is definitely not communism, I think that they're not right. <laughs> I think that what we're looking at is most definitely communism. And my usual argument, of course, and this bears on the title of this episode of the podcast, is that communism evolved, right? Uh, communism 3.0, right? Or maybe we could call it uh, 21st century communism. There's a lot of things we could call it. Uh, but what I think we're seeing is the succession of various forms of 20th century uh, societal and economic arrangement um, into this new 21st century communism based off of what I'm going to refer to as the China model. What's the China model? Looks like China. To understand this, we're going to have to break down Marx's idea of the negation of the negation, which is not exactly Marx's idea. It was actually from Hegel. Hegel talked about the negation of the negation, and then Marx criticized it vigorously and then imported it anyway. But um, for reasons that I think will become clear, though, it's kind of murky because it depends on what we're actually referring to with this kind of dialectical construction, the negation of the negation. Uh, I'm actually thinking of this as the negation of the negation of the negation. In other words, what I'm saying is that the China model or the ESG model that we're dealing with here in the West that mirrors it is the negation of the negation of the negation of our old models. That's going to require me to talk a little bit about Hegel, a lot about Marx, and try to break all this down for you just to get the quick, dirty introduction out of the way about the Hegel part. Hegel's dialectic was very frequently, I, I explained this at length before, very frequently organized in terms not of thesis, antithesis, synthesis, as we get from his predecessor, Immanuel Kant, but rather as abstract negation concrete. And this introduces a lot of interesting and important ideas. So what Hegel was saying is that we have an abstract conception of something at first, and then our abstract conception runs into its negations, that which shows us that our abstract conception of the thing is not complete, and that allows us to uh, come to a more concrete understanding of the thing. Another way that he kind of puts this, and on a much bigger scale, but that what exists in macrocosm in these esoteric religions exists also in microcosm, so on every scale. In macrocosm, you have this thing he calls the theoretical idea. That's the abstract conception of the world as it is. It's what we th how we think the world works, the theoretical idea. And it's meant to be our best approximation of what he calls the uh, absolute idea. The absolute idea is God to Hegel, right? It is the absolute. It is that beyond there, beyond which there is nothing. You know, the, it, it is all and everything, an undifferentiated all, you might even call it. And it's the only actually true thing in Hegel's very hermetic theosophical belief system. Why do I say that? Because Hermeticism seeks to see through the distinctions to see a more unified whole as a form of higher understanding. So you have the theoretical idea as our approximation of the absolute idea, our best guess as to how everything works, and then that gets put into practice, giving you what's called the practical idea. And then there are contradictions 
between the practical idea and the absolute, and which is the that is between the objective and the perfect, uh, and therefore those contradictions start to manifest and show that there must be contradictions within the theoretical idea, our guess about the absolute, and the absolute idea itself. And so the negation arises through the application of the practical idea, which is supposed to be the practical form or the objective applied form of the theoretical idea. And those contradictions force a revolution in thought and a turn of the dialectic. And so you have the theoretical idea is negated at the end by the practical idea, and then you arrive at a higher synthesis that is the negation of that. In other words, the negation of the negation. And that's Hegel's idea. So the idea of the negation of the negation is one turn around the spiral of the dialectic. You return from where you started, but at a higher level of understanding. You've been uplifted. Aufheben, or Aufgehoben in German was the magic word for this. And so I'm going to suggest that what we're looking at with the Chinese model or the China model is that if we start with Marxism and its application to the existing societies to which it got applied, the China model is the negation of the negation of the negation. So it's another step around this uh, sublating or, or dialectical spiral. But to complete that, there would have to be a, yet another negation that would take us to the completed world system, which is what I'm suggesting they're building using the China model as the beta test. That's a lot, and that's what we're going to try to unpack a little bit here. It's very complicated. But those ideas that I've just laid on to you, the abstract gets negated by its collision with, the rea with reality and its failure, frankly, and therefore becomes more concrete, is not a difficult thing to get your head around. We think we know how the world works, we try it out, it doesn't work, and therefore we have a more concrete understanding of the situation. And that would be fine if they were actually doing it in a scientific sense instead of in a sense that's supposed to reflect back on the absolute they believe they already know. The absolute is reflected in their perfect system of philosophy, or in this for Hegel, uh, what he called his system of science, or in Marx, what he called his, uh, his scientific socialism, um, the immortal science of Marxism, which can never be wrong. So what you have where this deviates from science isn't in its methodology. Where it deviates from science is in its assumption about whether theory or experiment is the thing that's true. And at the end of the day, their theory is the thing that has to be confirmed, whereas in science, the theory is supposed to be built around actual observations and your best, most imaginative con concept of the world, if it doesn't agree with experiment, is simply wrong. It's... Uh, uh, the difference could be put this way, is that they believe the immortal science of Marxism is never wrong, that it's only implemented incorrectly, so that has to be adjusted. Uh, the theory itself, communism as a religion, is still perfectly right and intact. It just didn't get implemented correctly. Science sees everything the other way around. The implementation is not an error. There are errors and so on, but the world is the thing that we're misunderstanding rather than other way around. So let's not get bogged down in the philosophy of science. Let's talk about China and its circumstances today and its relevance. And then we're going to compare ESG and then we're going to get into Marx. Okay, so China is a communist country. Let's just be blunt about that. Communists of strict obedience, as they're sometimes called, do not believe this. They think that communism is not what you have in China, that it has sold communism out. I think that Marx is going to contradict these people, and we're going to hear exactly why before too long. But that's because China is no longer running a Marxist-Leninist program the way that Mao did. Um, they can argue about whether Mao perverted communism or not, but certainly what's running in China today is a derivative. What's running in China today because of the way that they do is something called Xi Jinping thought or Xi Jinping theory. Uh, he, uh, Xi Jinping, he is obviously the guy in charge of China now. He's the president of China, uh, I guess chairman. And so his theory guides how China operates. But Xi Jinping theory is downstream from something called Deng Xiaoping theory. Deng Xiaoping, or sometimes this is called Dengism or Dengism, however you want to pronounce this, D-E-N-G-I-S-M, Dengism or Deng Xiaoping theory. Deng Xiaoping was one of Mao Zedong's longtime lieutenants. 
uh, in the CCP in China. And in fact, after Mao died in 1976, there was some um, jockeying for position and power, and Deng Xiaoping came out as the head of China in 1978, a couple of years later. And so he came out with his Deng Xiaoping theory um, based on what he inherited from Mao. So remember, he was one of Mao's longest lieutenants going back well before the Chinese Civil War in the 1940s, right after World War II. He was one of, of, of Mao's oldest and most loyal lieutenants. That's how he was in the position to assume Mao's chairmanship after Mao's death. Uh, and he inherited Mao's China, which was not doing well in 1978. In fact, Mao destroyed China. Mao destroyed China in virtually every way you could possibly imagine. I mean, you want to remember that communism isn't just a death cult. In the 20th century, it was a death cult that was headed, whether by Lenin, by Stalin, by Mao, by Pol Pot, by Castro. We could go down the list. We could name whoever we wanted to name. It was headed by cults of personality. And Mao ran a huge cult of personality where basically the entire country had to be consumed to his glory. And it was. We can talk about the devastation of the Civil War that installed his power. We could talk about the devastation of the Socialist High Tide program or his mul multiple purges before that in the 1950s. We could talk about the devastation of the Great Leap Forward, which was the single largest human-caused calamity in human history which devastated the Chinese people and economy, killed at least 40, if not closer to, to 50 or 60 million people. And then we can talk about the devastation that followed of the Chinese Cultural Revolution, which in its red phase at the beginning, 66 to 68, killed a couple million maybe, much less viciously brutal and a lot less starvation than you had during Great Leap Forward. And, but then by the end of the Cultural Revolution, which didn't technically end until Mao died because revolution has to be perpetual or continuous uh, in 1976, probably claimed the lives of about 20 million Chinese uh, beyond the 40 million of the Great Leap Forward or 50 million really of the Great Leap Forward and beyond the tens of million, or roughly 10 million maybe before that in China, not counting the civil war itself. So the economy was destroyed, the people were destroyed, the organization of the country was destroyed, plus it was distraught and dismayed because it didn't know what to do because its god, Mao, had just died and thrown everything into confusion. The people did not know how to deal with the fact that their dear leader had just died. And so this is the split, the place that Deng Xiaoping steps into the power structure of China, the CCP, that runs a democratic centralist program. The CCP controls the People's Republic of China. It's not to be questioned, and it does everything that it does for the glory of socialism and the development of eventually eventual Chinese and maybe world communism. And this is where Deng Xiaoping steps in, sees this devastation, and is in desperation. And Deng Xiaoping, contrary to Mao, who was running a very pro-Mao program, Deng Xiaoping was a much a very committed communist in the broad sense, but in the narrow sense, he was much more pragmatic. And anything that would solve the question of how to advance Chinese communist interests was on the table for Deng Xiaoping, where many things for Mao were not that way, because Mao had to, to stick very closely to Marxist-Leninist theory, um, so as not to have to backtrack all of his previous views. And this was a big thing. So Deng Xiaoping comes out, he does not do a full Khrushchev-style denunciation of Mao the way that Nikita Khrushchev uh, crucified Stalin in 1956, but he comes out and says that Mao was correct. Mao had a saying that he would say that the you know everything every time something really bad happened in in his 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 uh, regime, he would come out and say that it was it, it, we all have ten fingers and it was correct on nine fingers and mistakes were made on one finger, so it was nine tenths correct and one tenth incorrect. Well, Deng Xiaoping came out and said that Mao was correct on seven fingers and incorrect on three fingers, and therefore put some distance between himself and Mao, not having to repeat everything Mao did. And he came up with this program he called Open Up. And uh, in fact, the, the 
actual doctrine of Deng Xiaoping theory, aside from having to adhere to upholding communism, maintaining the Chinese uh, democratic centralism in the CCP, giving uh, all control of the of the People's Republic of China to the Chinese Communist Party, and also allegedly, but less in practice and more in a, as an honorific, upholding Mao Zedong thought and Marxism-Leninism. Those are the, the, the some of the characteristics of Deng Xiaoping theory uh, to prove that it's communist. But in addition, he said, we're going to have one country, two systems, and we're going to open up. And what he meant was they were going to open up their economy. They were going to in line with a very radical splinter take on Lenin's theory of productive forces, that you have to develop the productive forces in order to have enough production to get socialism to prove itself in order for it to develop to the next stage, which would be communism, that they were going to open a fascist Potemkin market economy inside of their communist system. So the deal with one country, two systems is there's one country, China, and it has two systems, a communist system and a fascist system operating at the same time. Now notice I didn't say it's a capitalist system because it isn't. It is a fascist system. In fact, it was imported and developed largely around the economic programs, specifically of the National Socialists in Germany from the 1930s. Not to say that they imported everything from National Socialism and say, oh my God, they're Nazis. No, well, maybe, but no, they were importing specifically the economic system of Nazi Germany, of the fascist programs. Fascist programs, according to Benito Mussolini, were the fusion of state and corporate power such that the corporations do the will of the state. Okay, And so they're going to put a fascist economy inside of a broadly communist system, and as Deng Xiaoping himself said, it would be done to the glory of socialism. And what this does is it allows this country to solve the problem of production, or in other words, create, as I've called it in the past, what sounds like an oxymoron, a productive socialism. And of course, if we look at our, our Herbert Marcuse over here in the West in the 1960s and 70s, Herbert Marcuse is explaining that the weakness of socialism isn't in its ideology at all. It has that correct. Its weakness is in the fact that it cannot produce. Whereas on the other hand, capitalism can produce, but it fails to be sustainable and inclusive. It's not equitable, so it's not inclusive. And it's not sustainable. Marcuse said capitalism proliferates false needs and causes people to believe in the culture of capitalism that those false needs are true needs and these needs proliferate. So capitalism produces more and more and more and more with no guardrail, with no stopping at all. And most of what it produces is junk even without the profit motive that leads to things like planned obsolescence, which he complained about a lot, capitalism itself is intrinsically designed to not be sustainable. It is an exponential curve that continues to grow forever until there's a collapse, which is why in One Dimensional Man he said that in fact that the, the free society that he imagines would certainly require a reduction in the future world population, but he also talks repeatedly about less plastic, less stuff, less gadgets, fewer things, and a living, honestly, he says this, with a lower standard of living. And so what we have operating in China is a Potemkin market that is actually a fascist program operating at the behest of the Communist Party. And it has to do everything in a way that uplifts and glorifies the Communist Party and recognizes and maintains its centrality, its so-called democratic centralism. So business leaders now are no longer the demons of the economy or the demons of the society. Business leaders are now stakeholders, if you will, in their system and are actually major decision makers. But if they veer from the Communist Party line or if they bring shame upon socialism or fail to build socialism, then they can be turned into enemies of the state and re-educated or disappeared virtually instantly. So we have this productive socialism that builds up in China. That's what I'm going to call the China model. I'm not going to get into how the U.S. State Department helped to architect that. That's a different podcast. I think I've covered it before. I'm going to talk now that in the West, we've decided that we needed to put a bridle on capitalism following Marcuse's orders and probably the same U.S. State Department, and to pull from Deng, our economy needs to be opened up. It doesn't need to just be more sustainable. It also needs to be more inclusive. In other words, it needs to be made equitable. In other words, it needs to have socialism infused into it. And that's what the ESG model does in the West. And I'm going to 
tell you yet again, the ESG model in the West is a direct mirror image of the China model in the East. And I know we have a lot of people realizing kind of in a panic at this moment that one of the most important priorities we have is to figure out how to unleash American manufacturing and American productivity again. And that what they're running up against is the the discovery that ESG is designed to make sure they cannot do that. In fact, what ESG produces is a Potemkin market that's mostly led by the business leaders, but who all have to be ideologically corralled. And it turns out they are working kind of in inverse. They don't have a CCP to whom they're answering. They answer to their own internal cartel and the state is dragged along with. So rather than having a fascism inside of a communism under ESG, we have a communism inside of a fascism. Remember, we're injecting inclusivity and equity. Those are socialist ideals or communist ideals into the program of capitalism. We're putting a bridle on capitalism so that it's not overproductive and doesn't produce wasteful things. And all that's to be determined by the stakeholder class, which are these major business leaders who know what the right interests of the global superstate would be and therefore can guide these multinational corporations, incidentally in collaboration with their friends in China whom they're trying to profit with. Um, and so we have the same model being built in a different way, more palatable to our situation, whereas Deng Xiaoping had the ability as the chairman of the CCP to just implement whatever he wanted. And of course, the people supported it because the profit motive that he unleashed allows them to uh, pursue their own interests and make money and become rich and not be in desperate poverty or at the complete dependency of the state anymore. You just have the state lurking in the background like in fascism, ready to destroy you and its value system is communist. So we have this exact same model and it has a bunch of names. Sustainable capitalism you hear sometimes, sometimes sustainable and inclusive capitalism. Sometimes, as from the Council for Inclusive Capitalism, you'll just hear it called Inclusive Capitalism. The Vatican is a major partner in that, as are about 600 CEOs of the largest corporations in the West. Um, stakeholder capitalism is also a brand name that's given to this management system in the, in the West, uh, where the stakeholders are the managers. It's these enlightened experts who know what the world really needs better than other people who are going to, you know, represent our stakes in how corporations and governments do business. Um, so what you have then here in the West under ESG is a fascistic economic control model that's run through asset management firms because that's where the overwhelming reservoir of capital lies. But it's coordinated not just through those firms themselves, but through nonprofits such as the World Economic Forum and the Council for Inclusive Capitalism, but also with governments in collaboration. They call this a public private partnership. So you might just think it's the three kind of biggest entities in this are the United Nations, the World Economic Forum, and the BlackRock. BlackRock an asset manager, but slash Vanguard, slash State Street, slash Goldman Sachs, these largest asset management firms. And they ob ob obtain this concept of a stakeholder group who understands the challenges to the environment, the social environment, and corporate governance better than anybody else. So they create this thing called stakeholder capitalism that is because they are a governing council, and governing council in Russian is Soviet they are actually a stakeholder Soviet. And so what we're dealing with in the West under ESG, you can call it a cartel, fine. You can call it organized crime. You can call it racketeering. It is all of those things, but its actual function is as such, is as a Soviet. It is stakeholder Sovietism. Okay, so this is a mirror image model taking place in the West to the one that you have uh, in Deng Xiaoping taking place in the East. And uh, here's how it works. It is a fascistic economic control model, in other words, kind of an economic cartel, working in public-private partnership with states and coordinated through nonprofits. Um, and there is a multi-level communist ethos buried within it. So the fascism's on the outside and the communism's on the inside. Well, what does that look like? Well, under the 
letter E for ESG. Uh, environmental, what you have is a program designed to hand over global power and hegemony to communist China. We're going to allow c communist China to grow, to build as much energy as they want, to build as many nuclear and coal power plants as they want. They are exempt from environmental standards as a developing nation, as it's called, even though they are in many ways either the richest or closest to richest country in, in the world. So they are a developing nation, so they're excused and allowed to have energy growth, whereas the West has to experience energy degrowth. Our entire way of life has to contract while theirs expands. That's called handing over global power and hegemony to communist China. That's much of the purpose of the E and ESG is to hand over global power and hegemony to communist China by building up their energy abundance and diminishing ours and trapping us in energy scarcity. There's also elements, especially throughout the West and the degrowth process because prog uh, program, because remember, we don't have ESG programs in China. They can choose to do them when they want and they get applause on the world stage and they don't have to do them when they don't want uh, and everything's fine. So here what we have is a program that in the Soviet Union was called the Kulakization. So the Kulaks were the rugged independent farmers who could basically organize their own lives or families and sometimes their villages, make sure everything was getting getting taken care of. For us, they're the independent, successful small business owners and the environmental regulations, among other regulations that are being imposed upon successful Kulak-run businesses are dekulakizing our uh, country in the same way that the Soviet Union dekulakized, except that the Soviet Union did it literally through starvation and murder and expropriation, whereas we're just doing it through regulatory capture and management or mismanagement. But that's the point. So you have the communist ethos coming in through the environmental programming in ESG. It's very nakedly, in fact, central to the social or S component of ESG. What is S in ESG doing? It is implementing social justice. This is a Leninist program. Actual equality, diversity, diversity in Russian, uh, Rosnebrazia is literally what we call diversity. <laughs> and it turns out it's the same program. They had one that's very uh, similar to what we call um, inclusion under the name indigenization, which is like Korenitsatsia or something like that. You'll have to look that one up, but you can read about it. And then they, of course, have actual equality, which is what we call equity, and it's like a one-to-one -one match. So the social justice and DEI program of the S part of ESG, although we have different identity politics involved, that matrix of identity politics that we call intersectionality being a direct import from Mao's matrix of, of uh, class identities that he used to, to move the cultural revolution, uh, but then this all stems back to Lenin and Stalin and under the branding of social justice. And that's what the S is for. S is for social justice. This is explicitly communism. It's, it's obvi obviously operating partly through cultural communist means. But now that we're talking about price fixing to control the economy coming from Kamala Harris and so on, um, the, the, the naked communist sides are showing in the economic sense as well. And uh, what this is primarily being implemented through this public-private partnership monstrosity, which is the Soviet, the stakeholder Soviet, um, the corporatist, aka Mussolini's fascism power nexus that is uh, is the cor big corruption at the center of Western and Western governance right now. And then the G score is governance, and the point of the governance score is to make sure that the corporations reward themselves for implementing this program and punish themselves for not implementing this program. Um, it's a social credit system for corporations. And the point of the G score is to bridle capitalism into the stakeholder Soviet model, like I just described. In other words, to turn it into a communist simulation of a business. Uh, and it's to actually also establish and install uh, commissars throughout, whether they're called ESG officers, DEI officers, sustainability officers, or whatever, who are there, political officers who are there to enforce and report to the central authorities, in this case, that being the asset management program uh, headed up by these huge firms in order to control businesses. So you have the Soviet model being imported through ESG to, to bring about a power transfer to the largest communist country still in the world and to implement direct advanced primarily cultural communist 
policy through the so-called S or social score. And so this is the, the world that we are living in. The Chinese have it on one side and we have it on the other. I want everybody to remember Deng Xiaoping himself made it very clear and Xi Jinping has made it very clear since uh, in recent years that China never abandoned communism. They are doing this as a tool to achieve communism by figuring out a new approach to unleashing the productive forces as Lenin said that they must in order to succeed. Both of these models require a social credit system in order to actually work. That social credit system in the form of ESG is being already applied to our businesses, and we already see people talking about articles being written about personal ESG scores. China in 2014 officially implemented its digital social credit system. Uh, we're all aware of it. There are people who downplay its existence that exist, as far as I can tell, only on the woke left and their counterparts on the woke right who don't want us to believe such a thing is actually there. I could get into their arguments, but I'm not going to bother. Uh, the long and short is that it is a less centrally coordinated program then we often fear many of the more egregious things that we see are local things, local attempts or programs or implementations, some of which are actually struck down from the Chinese government, and that the Chinese government overall has indicated that it does not necessarily have any uh, interest in creating a national social credit program. I don't know if that's true or not, but what I do know is that I have a copy of the Chinese Communist Party document from 2014 wherein they explained the rationale for implementing a social credit system. And this was from not some fringe area, but rather a central CCP authority. And it is not like I had to go hunt down or spy or whatever to get this document. It is available on the Stanford University website on their DigiChina platform where they take important Chinese documents to politics and translate them. The translation's not great, but I have a, the, I'm have going to read to you the two opening paragraphs to that Chinese Communist Party document explaining the purpose of the social credit system, which I'm going to try to just, just what's the relevance of it. This is how you have the necessary control mechanism and the necessary brainwashing tool, ideological remolding tool at the same time. Social credit does that in order to create the dungest economy and make it work, or the ESG economy and make it work, and I argue that those are actually the same thing in two different contexts. Productive socialism and sustainable capitalism are two sides of the same coin. You might even argue that they are dialectical pairs that will meet in negation of one another to complete the communist global system. But anyway, here's the social credit system description from the Chinese Communist Party itself. A social credit system is an important component part of the socialist market economy system. That's the first sentence. Lest anybody have lost the plot and think because 21st century communism doesn't look like 20th century communism, that it's not communism, the Communist Party of China says a social credit system is an important component part of the socialist market economy system. Let's put a pause on that, though, because you've just heard a specialist term you probably didn't know was a specialist term. Deng Xiaoping, when he talks about his one country, two systems, actually the, the model that they've implemented, which is one country, two systems, is called a socialist market economy. It's not a market economy, of course. It's a Potemkin market that's that operates at the behest of the CCP, here's how it actually works, is that the CCP, this is Deng Xiaoping theory, the, the government owns the land, the government owns the raw materials, and the government owns some of the heaviest of heavy capital, and then private interests are allowed to try to make money as they will uh, in that system. But because the government owns the land, the government owns the raw materials, and the government owns some of the heaviest of the capital, to, to, to be able to run these operations, the government can cut you off in a second if you are no longer serving the socialist market economy system, aka 
Deng Xiaoping theory-based Chinese communism, what he called socialism with Chinese characteristics. A more accurate name, when I'm not saying this is what Chinese means, Chinese doesn't mean fascist, but socialism with Chinese characteristics, as Deng Xiaoping referred to it, would more accurately be described as communism with fascist characteristics. That would be the correct expression not the euphemism expression. Okay, so now you know a little bit more about Deng Xiaoping theory and how it works, and I wish I would have said that earlier, but I kept remembering I had to say something and I couldn't remember what it was because I didn't put it in my notes, uh, and now I just remembered. But they call it a socialist market economy system. So when you hear socialist market economy, what that means is Deng Xiaoping theory communism. So do you understand this is 21st century communism? It is not an abandoning of communism. And in fact, when we get to Marx in a minute, you're going to hear it is the correct interpretation and completion of communism as Marx wrote in Capital. So a socialist credit system is an important component part of the socialist market economy system, which is your dungism, your corporate G-score, and the social governance system, which will be eventually your personal S and G scores. It is founded on laws, regulations, standards, and charters. It is based on a complete network covering the credit records of members of society and credit infrastructure. It is supported by the lawful application of credit information and a credit services system. Its inherent requirements are establishing the idea of a sincerity culture. In other words, that people actually believe the socialism. That's why it's a brainwashing tool. And carrying forward... Uh, carrying forward sincerity and traditional virtues. Of course, what it means is socialist virtues. It uses encouragement to keep trust and constraints against breaking trust as incentive mechanisms. In other words, it uses carrots and sticks to make people not just conform, but brainwash themselves to believe that's how they should behave. And its objective is raising the honest mentality and credit levels of the entire society. In other words, making it more socialist, but in this new 21st century Deng Xiaoping model. It goes on to say, accelerating the construction of a social credit system is an important basis for comprehensively implementing the scientific development view, that's a code for Marxism, and building a harmonious socialist society. Very explicit what its goals are, building a harmonious socialist society. It is an important method to perfect the socialist market economy systems, that means Dungism and the corporate G-score, for accelerating and improving social governance, that's your personal social and governance scores, ESG scores, and it has an important significance for strengthening the sincerity consciousness, in other words, thought reform or ideological remolding, it has a important significance for strengthening the sincerity consciousness of the members of society, foregoing a desirable credit environment, raising, uh, sorry, not foregoing, forging a desirable credit environment, raising the overall competitiveness of the country, which I would say is to the glory of socialism, as Deng Xiaoping said, and stimulating the development of society and the progress of civilization. Progress of civilization, Lenin was extraordinarily clear, means progress toward communism. So how do we understand all of this in Hegelian and dialectical terms? Let's go back to that theoretical idea, practical idea thing. And for those of you that follow my Twitter, this is the epiphany I had in my sleep the other day and woke up still remembering it. I was very excited that I, I literally thought this up in my sleep, woke up middle of the night thinking it, very excited, went back to sleep, woke up in the morning, wrote it down. It was still there. That usually doesn't happen. Okay, so what we did in the 20th century worldwide was a number of totalitarian experiments communism and fascism in particular. And we, if we were to combine those experiments and the results, let's look at those experiments and the results and combine them with the absolute unwavering religious commitment of communists to their religion of communism, this is what we get. First of all, in, say, Soviet Union and in, the, in China, well, I should say in Russia and in China that became Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China, among other places, a feudal society was subjected to Marxism. And what it did was, in the long run, even though there was a reign of a, what they called actually existing socialism at the time, in the long run it collapses. And what's left 
uh, at least in Russia, was an oligarchical kleptocracy where the government is basically, you have oligarchs that are untouchable who rule with a basically iron fist and rob their population. And you have, uh, in China, they took a different road. Um, in China, what happened was when the, the society collapsed um, and Mao died, Deng Xiaoping came in with his open up program. In other words, I would say that uh, the negation of the negation, so to speak, of a feudal society is a collapsed society, but Deng Xiaoping rescued it by taking it in the next direction. Now, what happened in the places where they attempted to force capital or force socialism onto capitalism? So this happened in a lot of European countries that wouldn't go undergo revolt for themselves. The socialist revolution did not arrive as Marx intended, uh, but they were forced from without and they were subjected to Marxism and what you see in virtually every case, whether it's Germany, whether it's Italy in the 1910s, 20s, and 30s, is that you get fascism as a reaction. And we see this rising bid toward fascism. Spain, of course, famously with Franco, goes fascist in order to avoid communism. A lot of people argue that Franco saved Spain. I don't think he did. But what we see is, in fact, that the negation of the negation of capitalism by socialism turns out to be fascism. You do not get to communism. You get fascists. And so this has created quite the conundrum for would-be 21st century communists. But Marxists never doubt Marxism. They only doubt its attempted implementation and the people who tried to do it. So therefore, it's not that Marxist faith is wrong. The immortal science of Marxism cannot be wrong. It is that the people like Lenin and Stalin and Mao and so on, who attempted to implement it, did so poorly, causing this reaction and backlash that led to fascism, causing these collapses like after the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution where Deng Xiaoping picked up. So what is this in Hegelian dialectical terms, as I promised? So communism, after these experiments and given the faith of Marxists, communism is still regarded by communists as the correct theoretical idea. It's how the world should work. They think it's the best reflection of the absolute idea of how the perfectly ordered society, the Platonic Republic, should actually look. So communism is not questioned in any way. It remains held as the correct theoretical idea. But what they discovered was that the attempt to force implement socialism did not work in either feudal or capitalist contexts. And in fact, what you find out then is that at the economic level, but not necessarily otherwise, except incorporating some of the nationalism, that's a point to, to make, is that fascism comes to be seen as the correct practical idea. Fascism can produce without having to sacrifice totalitarian control. Fascism, in fact, can produce better than freedom can produce, so they think, because you can marshal with a command economy, you can marshal the productive forces exactly as needed and desired by the government in an instant without all of this fussing around of freedom, without this producing things that are unsustainable to the economy itself, which is, of course, a laughingstock because these, these entities always produce in a, in a way that destroys themselves, trying to show off that their system is the best. But what you end up with then is that the belief system coming into communism 3.0 or 21st century communism or corporate communism, you can call it what, what you want. Those are some names that I use for it. Uh, what in, in, in Hegelian terms, which is where Marx got a lot of his ideas, what you see is that communism is still held as the correct theoretical idea and fascism is regarded as a correct practical idea. And the goal of the Hegelian dialectic is always to achieve the absolute by synthesizing the theoretical idea with the practical idea. And that will provide the absolute idea, or in this case, the fusion of communism and fascism is the absolute system. It's the one that will work. It is the one that Lenin said will form although overwhelmingly powerful, a semi-state that can wither away to form the stateless, classless society of socialism, which, of course, is ridiculous. The reason some nationalism creeps in, just since I brought it up, is because it is actually following less the internationalist model and more the Chinese model, uh, which borrowed heavily off of Stalin because of its plight. Uh, and Stalin believed in a model that he called socialism in one country, which was to build up the socialist power base in Soviet Union um, alone and not worry about 
trying to convert the rest of the world. This was in, in, in difference to um, Lenin's idea of a global revolution and Trotsky's idea of what he called perpetual revolution, where one country after another, after another, after another, after another would be subjected, making them all fall like dominoes, uh, leveraging the power of the Soviet Union to do it. Uh, this is a more nationalistic approach, believe it or not, but with a uh, huge internationalist or global bent by getting all of the different players on the same page and then letting that synthesize into one model in the end. But this synthesis is going to believe that in theory it's communist and in practice it's fascist and the goal is to harmonize theory and practice through the reflection against what? Against theory. Against their beliefs about what the ideal society looks like which is a communism that can produce. And the fascist model is their production model, and the communist ethos is their vision for society. This is communism 3.0. It is the fusion of communism and fascism in this way. Uh, China has built this program, and he did. They, they did so in the wake of Mao's death with Deng Xiaoping's one country, two systems model, and they did so more or less explicitly and without apology, even to the point where they have remarked in the past that the method of economic growth that they've espoused is more or less imported from national socialism from the Nazis and also uh, Stalin's ideas about what were called national socialist ideas, but not that they weren't Nazi ideas, that about one uh, communism in one country. And the goal was to figure out a way to maintain the ideology, the theoretical idea, while um, unleashing the productive forces in line with Lenin's theory of productive forces uh, to elevate the, to a global power uh, position where they could start to leverage the world toward their system. So the idea in China then is that the practical idea, fascism, has entered into the theoretical idea in order to negate it and complete it. That's the fancy Hegelian dialectical language. Practical idea, fascism, enters into the theoretical idea of communism in order to negate it, in other words, to cancel out its failures and lift it up to a higher level and complete it. And ESG copies this program exactly in the West. The theoretical idea of communism is now entering in through the practical idea, which is a corrupted capitalist market economy that has adopted a corporate cartel through the finance asset management system. So they have a fascist program running, coordinated again through things like World Economic Forum and fealty to the United Nations as a governing body. No specific country is in charge of this. And the theoretical idea of communism enters into this control mechanism, this fascist control net mechanism, to negate it and complete it. So communism comes in through a fascist takeover of our corporate environment through giant multinational corporations deciding to collude not just with each other but also with um, governments facilitated by nat gigantic nonprofit organizations like the World Economic Forum and uh, the United Nations. And the goal is that the, this will actually allow us to negate naked, raw capitalism finally and complete it. Not just take it into the socialist to communist um, channel that Marx talked about in a kind of very simplistic way, but actually to complete the capitalist program uh, as it was intended by Marx, to, to take hold of those productive forces and the products of capitalism and the everything that it's able to produce, the productivity of capitalism, and push it toward socialist uh, redistribution so that we can achieve the perfect uh, communist society. And so in other words, what we're dealing with then is in China and then in the West under ESG is that we have two global systems that actually share the same model, although in details inverted somewhat from one another, that will eventually be able to synthesize together to get to the global communism, in other words, the negation of the negation of the negation. And so this process of negation and completion is the subject of today's podcast, which is what I'm calling dialectical succession. Now we can finally dig in. I had originally intended to start here, by the way, and then I figured I better set the table so we know what we're talking about. And Marx kind of called it, and I hate to say that, um, but what we're looking at with this fusion, despite what the communists of strict obedience want to believe, their religion left them behind. These morons think that they want to debate me about this so they can go rant. They don't even know their religion left them behind. It's like, what is there to debate? You don't, they don't even know what they're talking about. 
they, they don't know that history used them, then discarded them, and has moved on without them. Their religion left them behind. Well, and I think when we read this from, from Marx and Capital, you're going to hear that, uh, oh, James knows what he's talking about. He didn't make it up. This is real Marxism that we're dealing with here in 21st century communism, unfortunately. Uh, although Marx said so much stuff and he's so messy that you can find the real Marxism in basically any direction you want. You can find uh, the real Marxism in um, endless growth. Uh, you can also find uh, Marxism, allegedly the real Marxism, as Kohei Saito did uh, in his book, Marx and the Anthropocene, in degrowth. So the real Marx is everywhere you need him to be in order to advance your power, but that's consistent in, with Marxism and not what we're talking about. Uh, I don't want to digress. So the key concept that we're going to deal with is very abstract, as I said. It's, in fact, abstruse. I, When I first heard it, I had no idea what in the hell I was talking about. I'm not 100% sure here a couple of years later that I have a full grasp of it, but I can actually talk articulately about it. And then the thing is that because of the macrocosm, it applies on this big scale, and microcosm, it applies in small scales that don't totally match up, uh, as, as Hegel called it, a circle made of circles. Um I find the, the concept of the negation of the negation to be a bit complicated. And of course, Marx imported it from Hegel while also saying he wasn't going to import it from Hegel. So it's a very uh, bizarre concept. But this is the, ultimately this negation of the negation is in fact the dialectical machinery by which Marx believed history moves toward its intended endpoint. We're going to use the term succession. And I don't know if one negation equals a succession or if you have to have that negation and completion. I think that's the correct expression. You negate and then complete. In other words, you, you do a full sublation to get to a succession so that, say, socialism succeeds capitalism, according to Marxist theory. Communism succeeds socialism, according to communist theory. Capitalism succeeds uh, feudalism in communist theory. But this is, this is how Marx believed history moves. Right toward its intended endpoint, which is communism. Remember, we're going back to we're going back home, according to Marxism. We're all going back to communist Eden, where it's like tribal communism, but for everybody all, all at the same time. But Marx criticized Hegel for this idea a lot. So Hegel was very much more invested in the idea of the negation of the negation. So what, what does that mean? So the negation of the negation is where, say, um, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, and then we'll get into some more abstruse examples. But this is be like, uh, so I said that capitalism is supposed to be the negation or succession, really, of feudalism. Well, then when you do that again, you get to socialism, right? So that's a negation followed by a second negation. Um, I don't know if that's the best way to look at it, because sometimes what I think of it with negation of the negation would be, let's say, that the contradictions of capitalism arise, right? So that's the negation of capitalism. And then the negation of that negation of capitalism is a, re, a revolutionary reconstitution of society and resulting in socialism. So socialism as the succession of capitalism is the negation of the negation of capitalism. But that's, that's one example. Another example, and I think I have this further down in my notes, so I'll get awkward when I get to that point because I'm doing it early, uh, is actually what I just said, that we're going home, right? So Marx believed that the... Uh, original state of human beings or state of nature was in these tri primitive tribal communist situations and that what we're going to do is we're going to negate that through different forms of productive forces which could be slavery which could be feudalism which could be capitalism or which could be in a, co a command economy under socialism though that one counts as different and what we're ultimately going to do so productive forces negate our original tribal communism, but what we're going to do is eventually seize the productive forces and negate the productive forces uh, sequence and return back to communism, but not communism down on the low level of primitive communism, but having walked the spiral upward one level to a global or maybe national first, then global communism. So do you see, see what I'm talking about? Um, how it takes place on multiple levels at once, and this is true for, for Hegel, Hegel as well. Um, Anyway, Marx criticized and imported this kind of an inverted way. It's going to take a lot of unpacking, and uh, we'll come back to Hegel. So let's talk about Marx and how he uses this concept in Capital, although it's certainly not the first time he used it. So this appears in Chapter 32 of Capital, Volume 1. Uh, 
which is very near the end uh, in this document that I have. It is page 539 out of 547. It's only two pages long. And the title of the chapter is Historical Tendency of Capitalist Accumulation. Remember, this is one of the things that I do where I'm going to read to you from Capital, where the Marxists will say, has James ever even read Marx? And so let's read Marx. He says, what does the primitive accumulation of capital, that is, its historical genesis, resolve itself into? Insofar as it is not immediate transformation of slaves and serfs into wage labor, laborers. So this is Marx's idea, right? Slaves are the slave economy. Serfs are the feudal economy. Wage laborers or wage slaves are the capitalist economy. But those three things are actually three manifestations of the same thing. And that's why you have primitive communism and you have global communism and in between you just have manifestations of the same problem which is uh, insofar as it is not the immediate transformation of slaves and serfs into wage laborers and therefore a mere change of form it only means the expropriation of the immediate producers that is the dissolution of private property based on the labor of its owner private property as the antithesis to social collective property exists only where the means of labor and the external conditions of labor belong to private individuals. So in the original tribe, there were no private individuals. You were all part of the tribe. There was no private property. And then private property is the antithesis of that social collective property. And it exists only where the means of labor, labor and the external conditions of labor belong to private individuals. That is the negation of the original circumstance. It needs to be re-negated or negated a second time to succeed to global communism. He says, but according as these private individuals are laborers or not laborers, private property has a different character. The numberless shades that it at first sight presents correspond to the intermediate stages lying between these two extremes. The private property of the laborer is his means of production sorry, in his means of production, is the foundation of petty industry, whether agricultural, manufacturing, or both. So the means of production controlled by your average laborer is your ability to run a small business. Petty industry, again, is an essential condition for the development of social production and of the free individuality of the laborer himself. Of course, this petty mode of production exists also under slavery, serfdom, and other states of dependence, but it flourishes, it lets loose its whole energy, it attains its adequate classical form only where the laborer is the small, or sorry, is the private owner of his means, his own means of labor set in action by himself, the peasant of the land which he cultivates, the artisan of the tool which he handles as a virtuoso, 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 there we go. So the, and maybe it's a virtuoso and I would have just done better not to sound so damn smart pronouncing it. Um, so what he's saying here is that these small private laborers are actually kind of legitimately working with their stuff and they are unleashing their productive potential. In other words, they're engaging in productive forces correctly. But of course, what he's going to say is that capitalism comes along and expropriates them from the ability to work for themselves. So in this regard, people could read this and say Marx was extremely pro-small business. He was anti-big corporation, right? Well, um, kind of, I mean, look at what Lenin and Stalin especially did to the kulaks or what, what Mao did to people who didn't collectivize, right? So maybe not so much, uh, but let's just stick with that. Um, where do we leave off? The, this mode of production presupposes parceling of the soil and scattering of the other means of production. As it excludes the concentration of these means of production, it also excludes cooperation, division of labor within each separate process of production, the control over, and the productive application of the forces of nature by society, and the free development of the social productive powers. It is compatible only with a system of production and a society moving within narrow and more or less primitive bounds. To perpetuate it would be, as uh, Picur rightly says, uh, to decree universal mediocrity. So he understands somehow that big corporations allow you to do things that small businesses can't. He says at a certain stage of development, 
it brings forth the material agencies for its own dissolution. From that moment, new forces and new passions spring up in the bosom of society, but the old social organization fetters them and keeps them down. It must be annihilated. It is annihilated. Its annihilation, the transformation of the individualized and scattered means of production into socially concentrated ones, of the pygmy property of the many into the huge property of the few, the expropriation of the great mass of the people from the soil, from the means of subsistence, and from the means of labor, this fearful and painful expropriation of the mass of the people forms the prelude to the history of capital. All right, so what he just said there actually was him describing the formation of capitalism. And he's describing it as expropriation of these artisans, these farmers. So you have this farmer, you have that farmer, Farmer Joe, Farmer Bob, and they're growing their stuff. And you have, you know, Mr. Smith over here doing his smithy work. You have your various artisans making tools, making things, building houses one by one, each unique and individual. And then corporations come along. People come along and say, you know what? I have a good technique for, say, farming, or I have a good technique for smithing, so I'm going to run my farm, buy more land, get things more more capital, make it all bigger, and rather, first of all, I'll be j just be able to use economies of scale to drive these small, uh, mediocre people out of business, and I'll be able to actually accrue their talent, so I'll get, you know... Nine out of 10 of the best blacksmiths will come work for me, and together those nine out of 10 will be able to come up with things that are superior to what number 10 could do, even if he was the best blacksmith in the world. And so what's gonna happen is all the blacksmiths are gonna be expropriated into a factory that can produce ironworks faster, better, and cheaper, and more consistently. So now the artisan work of iron or artisan work of farming because of big farms, big uh, corporate farms, is going to drive all of the, the small business people out of out of business and what you're going to have is um, this new capitalist form in other words the expropriation of the mass of the people forms uh, the, sorry the expro the expro expropriation of the great mass of people from the soil from the means of subsistence and from the means of labor this fearful expropriation of the mass of the people forms a prelude to the history of capital because where does he say it? I was looking for oh from the pygmy property of the many to the huge property of the few so you have your little pygmy property and you run your business on it but somebody like Walmart comes along with its huge property and annihilates you and expropriates you from your small business this is what he's talking about and he has a point and in fact we have tried to figure out how to deal with that with antitrust legislation and with anti-monopoly legislation and some of that is has been applied very successfully and freed up the middle class to its productivity and some of it has not been applied very successfully like BlackRock is still in business where antitrust needs to be applied to take it down but you get the um, general idea of what he's talking about he says it comprises a series of forcible methods of which we have passed in review only those that have been epoch making as methods of the primitive accumulation of capital the expropriation of the immediate producers was accomplished with merciless vandalism and under the stimulus of passion uh, of passions the most infamous the most sordid the pettiest and the most meanly odious self-earned private property that is based so to say on the fusing together of the isolated independent laboring individual with the conditions of his labor is supplanted by capitalistic private property which rests on exploitation of the nominally free labor of others that is on wage labor so this is capital this is how marx explains it as soon as this process of transformation by the way if you didn't realize that marx marx's critiques of capitalism are actually critiques of monopoly and once you understand that it's critiques of monopoly and olig uh, oligarchy then um you can come to understand that uh his critiques of capitalism as what we think of as a market economy both hit and miss at the same time uh, he's completely correct about how Walmart takes over, but he's completely incorrect to say that that's what we want. Um, but on the other hand, we do want to allow corporations to grow, just not to where they get to the exploitative stage. 
but I digress. I don't want to digress because we got a lot to cover. It says, as soon as this process of transformation has sufficiently decomposed the old society from top to bottom, as soon as the laborers are turned into proletarians, their means of labor into capital, as soon as the capitalist mode of production stands on its own feet, then the further socialization of labor and further transformation of the land and other means of production into socially exploited and therefore common means of production, as well as the further expropriation of private proprietors, takes a new form. That was a very long sentence, but there was some very important stuff in there that I want to make it all clear uh, what he's talking about. Uh, notice how he says the further socialization of labor and the further transformation of land and so on. Marx actually believes that capitalism is a quasi-socialist program. It's just that you have lots of little uh, corporate owners who are basically little socialists. They have socialized the means of production by getting lots of other people to do the work for them, which they then pay them a wage for. But it's essentially already tipping toward, it's not you with your stuff building a business. It's you with your stuff building an empire. And you have basically like a feudal lord. You have lots of people working under you. You already have socialized production. Um, you would not be able to produce Apple. I know, um, what's his name? Tim Cook is that who's in charge of Apple would not be able to produce what Apple produces by himself. He has to have an entire social apparatus in order to do it. But anyway, after that transformation to the large corporation stage takes place, he says the further expo uh, expropriation of private proprietors and the, uh, um, common means of production all take a new form. That which is now to be expropriated, he says, is no longer the laborer working for himself, so the many by the few, but the capitalist exploiting many laborers. So now he says there's supposed to be a turn, and this is how you go from capitalism to socialism. So when capitalism maxes itself out and expropriates as many possible people from their own livelihoods as possible and makes them work for a socialized production method, then it's just time for the workers to say, you know what, we don't actually need the bosses. So now the capitalists are going to get expropriated by the workers. That's what he's saying. That's the next step. That which is now to be expropriated is no longer the laborer working for himself, but the capitalist exploiting many laborers. This expropriation is accomplished by the action of the imminent laws of capitalistic production itself by the centralization of capital. Like I said, they become their own little kind of lords, right? He says, one capitalist always kills many. Hand in hand with this centralization or this expropriation of many capitalists by few, develop on an ever-extending scale the cooperative form of the labor process, the conscious technical application of science, the methodological cultivation of the soil, the transformation of the instruments of labor into instruments of labor only usable in common, the economizing of all means of production by their use, as means of production of combined socialized labor, the entanglement of all peoples in the net of the world market, and with this, the international character of the capitalistic regime. Now, this is actually a very long sentence. It's very indicative of the world that we have now with our large multinational corporations. And so what he's saying, like I said, is what's going to happen is you have the corporations get bigger and bigger and bigger, and they're already doing a socialized production program. But what's happening is that the boss is, pro is mainly profiting off of this while nobody else is. The workers are not. So the workers are being exploited. So the workers are now going to team up together and say, we can run this without the bosses. We don't actually need the managers in order to make it work. And we don't need the capital owners. We can just declare that we all own this together. As it turns out, that doesn't actually work. When you try to do that, when you try to collectivize, the people know, when, when everybody owns it, nobody owns it. It so nobody takes care of it uh, the way that they should. When somebody owns it, somebody's ass is on the line for it, and somebody pays a big cost when it falls apart. The cost is the cost of the factory breaking down is concentrated on the owner who has a huge vested interest to get that fixed. It is not diffused and spread out across the say 2,000 workers uh, who who don't have the capacity without becoming managers themselves to figure out how to fix it and then who actually decides to care. So it doesn't actually work, but this is what he's saying. The thing's already operating as social production, so why don't we just get rid of the people who are profiting off of the fact that they've built a method of social production? That's his argument. 
That's that's the case of Marxism in another interminably long sentence. It says, along with the constantly diminishing number of the magnets of capital, so there's a smaller and smaller number of corporate oligarchs who run everything, who usurp and mon monopolize all advantages of this process of transformation, grows the mass of misery, oppression, slavery, degradation, exploitation, but with this too grows the revolt of the working class. So he says, basically, the conditions that we're finding ourselves under right now with the increasing super corporatization of all parts of production in the world eventually pisses people off, right? It makes all these things miserable, but this grows ready for that revolt where we don't need the bosses anymore, right? And he says a class always, that the, the revolt of the working class comes from a class always increasing in numbers and disciplined, united, organized by the very mechanism of the process of capitalist production itself. Turns out that wasn't quite right, but that's what he said. The monopoly of capital becomes a fetter upon the mode of production, which has sprung up and flourished along with and under it. Centralization of the means of production and socialization of labor at last reach a point where they become incompatible with their capitalist integument. The integument, sorry, this integument is burst asunder. The knell of capitalist private property sounds the expropriators are expropriated. So he's describing what happens in the seizing of the means of production in a socialist revolution. And we're getting close to the point where he uses the phrase in the end of the chapter. The capitalist mode of appropriation, he says, the result of the capitalist mode of production produces capitalist private property. This is the first negation of individual private property as founded on the labor of the proprietor. So if you're a sole proprietor and you have your little shop, you have your individual private property, but capitalism comes along and negates your private property. It turns it into corporate property. It buys up your little business and, and, and puts it in part of the giant mega corporation. This is the first negation of individual private property as founded on the labor of the proprietor, but capitalist production begets with the inexorability of a law of nature its own negation. It is the negation of the negation. Well, there's that phrase right there. This does not reestablish private property for the producer. Remember, the negation of the negation doesn't bring you around the circle to the same spot. It brings you around the circle to a new higher level, right? So capitalism abolished individual private property by collectivizing it, by scooping up all the capital and letting you work with it, although it's no longer yours. So you're not working with your stuff, you're working with the company's stuff, but the company will beat your ass if, and fire you or whatever if you break their stuff. And this, he says, is going to rupture, as we just described. And this, he says, does not reestablish private property for the producer, but gives him individual property based on the acquisition of the capitalist era. This is extremely important. It gives him individual property based on the... Notice that there is no individual private property. Private property is gone. It's property that you're allowed to use individually, but there is no private to it. You can't withhold it from others any longer because it's yours. But it gives him individual property based on the acquisition of the capitalist era. That is, on cooperation in the possession in common of the land and the means of production. Now, I hate to blow the punchline, but I always do when I get to it. That's what Deng Xiaoping is doing. Cooperation and the possession in common of the land and the means of production. The Deng Xiaoping model, Dengism, says that, yeah, private interests can pursue their own individual earnings, your own individual property, but they own the land, they own the heavy capital, they own the raw materials. Those are held by the party, by the state, in the name of the masses. And the work is done in a socialized, cooperative fashion on capital that is ultimately the possession in common of the land and of the means of production. This is why I say that what they're doing in China is, in fact, in line with capital, with Marx, and that what we're dealing with is a global communist revolution to bring us all into this program. The transformation of scattered private property, just to finish the paragraph, even though we already read the negation of the negation part, the transformation of scattered private property arising from individual labor into capitalist private property is naturally a process incomparably more protracted, violent, and difficult 
than the transformation of capitalistic private property already practically resting on socialized production into socialized property. In other words, once you get to a major monopolistic or oligarchical situation like we have under BlackRock, it's just a matter of kind of transforming the form to enter into a socialist system. You already have a socialist system in practice that's aka literally fascism is already a socialist system in practice it just has to get the ideology right now so that it will begin to wither the state away like lenin said marx finishes by saying in the former case we had the expropriation of the mass of the people by a few usurpers that's the development of big capital taking up all the small proprietors and in the latter we have the expropriation of a few usurpers by the mass of the people and it turns out that that never actually works in practice. But now you know where Marx is coming from. And now we can go back to Hegel and talk about this negation of the negation thing because we just heard it. And we heard that capitalism negates the small private owner by collectivizing his productive capacities. And then that in its second negation becomes socialism by negating the usurpers at the top of the program. So the negation of the negation of small-time capitalism becomes socialism. And so, like I said before, Hegel's formulation of the dialectic was that you understand things in the abstract, which is in line with your best guess of the theoretical idea, and then the, that encounters in practice or through the practical idea its negative or its negation, which leads you to a greater or more concrete understanding. In other words, the abstract leads to the negation, leads to the negation of the negation, which is not the original abstract idea, but it is now better understood on a higher level, and that's your negation of the negation. And this is actually written about in Phenomenology of Spirit by Hegel. And I don't know if I've read much Hegel to you before because, well, I'm going to read you some Hegel and you'll see why I haven't read you a lot of Hegel. This is Hegel, Phenomenology of Spirit. In thus pointing out the capital N now, I'm not going to do the capital N part every time, but he capitalizes now, right? In thus pointing out the now, we see then merely a process which takes the following course. First, I point out the now and it is asserted to be the truth. I point it out, however, as something that has been, or as something canceled and done away with. I thus annul and pass beyond that first truth, and in the second place I now assert as the second truth that it has been, that it is superseded. So there's your supersession or succession. Now pause. What the hell? Why is this now? This discussion's a little bit weird. He's actually discussing the concept of now, and he's like, it, it reminds me of that scene in Spaceballs where they're watching the video of themselves, Rick Moranis and whoever it was that played uh, uh, Colonel Sanders, and uh, they're watching the video of themselves, and they're like, when is this? And he's like, this is now. We'll go back to then. Well, we can't go back to then. Why? Because this is now. It, and anyway, it reminds me of Spaceballs. But what he's looking at <laughs> is here's this idea of now, but by the time we're talking about now maybe or at some other time, now is no longer now, but it was now when it was now, but it's not now anymore. So there's this idea of now, which is ever present, which is right now. And then there's the idea of now, which is already past, which was now when it was now, but it's not now anymore. See why it reminds me of Spaceballs? And so anyway, that's literally, first I point out the now, and it is asserted to be the truth. I point it out, however, as something that has been. So it's no longer the now. Or is something canceled and done away with? So we have this abstract idea of now, right? Of nowness, right now. But as soon as we can think of now, it's already not now. It's already a different now. So there are lots of nows. So then the now is negated by then. So now there is no now. Now is gone. Now was. We'll, we'll go, where and where are we? We're at now. We'll go back to then. We can't go back to then. I'm telling you, it's space balls. This is straight up Mel Brooks comedy. Okay. So what we have to understand is that there are these kind of universal now, which is an abstract, but then there's the particular now, which is the now that I meant. This now, not some other now. This now. A certain now. And that's a concrete understanding of now. So you have now, but then you realize because of then that now is negated by the passage of time. And therefore, when I say now, I mean a specific time that we can all understand this particular now, not that particular now. And this now we can understand as now. And then we have a concrete understanding of what somebody means. Let me read it again. 
First, I point out the now, and it is asserted to be the truth. I point it out, however, as something that has been or something canceled and done away with. I thus annul and pass beyond that first truth, and in the second place, I now assert as the second truth that it has been, that it is superseded. But thirdly, what has been is not. Because it's before, right? It's not anymore. I then supersede, cancel, it's having been. I'm assuming that somewhere in supersede and cancel there we have Alfhaben, but I'm not sure. I then supersede, cancel, it's having been. The fact of its being annulled, the second truth, negate thereby the negation of the now and return and so, doing to the first position that now is. Do you see why I don't read Hegel out loud? But what he, he's saying what I just said with the whole space wells thing. The now and pointing out the now are thus so constituted that neither one nor the other is an immediate simple fact, but a process with diverse moments in it. So now is, now is, but now is actually a process of lots of nows. This is set up, it is, it says, it says this is set up. It is, however, rather another that is set up. The this Oh, sorry. I read that wrong. I thought it was like literally a, he's so, so bad. I thought it was literally a, uh, like paragraph marker. A, this is set up. It is, however, rather an other that is set up. The, this is superseded and this otherness, this canceling of the former is again, it is itself again annulled. So, and so turned back to the first, but this first reflected thus onto itself is not exactly the same as it was to begin with. See, that's what I was telling you. Namely, something immediate. Rather, it is a something reflected into self, a simple entity which remains in its otherness, what it is, a now which is any number of nows. And that is the genuinely true now. The now is simple daytime, which has many nows within it, hours. A now of that sort, again, an hour is similarly many minutes. And this now, a minute, in the same way, uh, many nows, and so on. Showing, indicating, pointing out the now is thus itself the very process which expresses what the now in truth really is. Namely, a result or a plurality of nows all taken together. And the pointing out is the way of getting to know, of experiencing, that now is a universal. Was that clear or what? So that's why we don't read Hegel, but there you have the idea of the negation of the negation, which is where you take the abstract concept of now and you negate it because now moves around and <laughs> we're at a different now, and thus you can understand the universality of the concept of now being any given time, which he never actually says very clearly, any given specific time, this particular now, which could be any of this particular now, uh, and you have a concrete understanding of now, meaning at the present time. And then he has this really weird and conf confusing discussion that somehow a day is a, is a now, and then also uh, an hour is a now inside of that now, and then a minute is a now inside of that now, and then a second is a minute or is a now inside of that. And we could cut further. And he really did say that. I'm not getting into it. So he actually, Hegel describes that there are in fact three modes of, of the dialectic and the negation of the negation is one of the three. The three are quantity transforming itself into quality or quality into quantity. So when Herbert Marcuse is talking about the requirement for a qualitative change, he's actually always saying this. He's always talking about how quantity under the capitalist system, we have lots of stuff, but it has to be transformed into quality. It has to be turned into stuff that's worth having and that we appreciate. This is a transition from a GDP, productive consumptive economy, to a well-being economy. Quantity has to transform into quality. But the thing is, is on the other hand, you also have to have quality that transforms into quantity. If you have a socialist system like you do in China that has quality because it's communist and it's a theoretical idea, that has to be able to transform itself into quantity. In other words, it needs to be able to produce as well. And so this is one of the forms of the dialectic according to uh, Hegel. 
quantity has to transform into quality and quality into quantity. And that is literally your production of bridled capitalism or sustainable capitalism alongside your production, your, your, your creation of productive socialism. A second is the unification of opposites. These things that appear opposite are only really comprehensible as part of the same whole, which is the better and higher understanding of the thing. And then third is negation of the negation or succession. So, or supersession, supersession, I guess we could use that word instead. So what do we mean by unification of opposites? Well, you know, let's look at black and white. Those are opposites, right? They're opposite tints. They're the maximally opposite tints. Gray is a tint, a set of tints, many tints in between. And we could do the whole now thing with gray instead, but we're not going to because we're not Hegel and we're not that confused. But what Hegel would indicate is that as a pair of opposites, black and white, that black when we encounter it in the natural world is usually the absence of, of light. Light, when it hits things, turns them white. If you increase the intensity of the light, it becomes whatever you shine the light on appears white. And then black is what you end up with in the shadow. So black is only comprehensible as the absence of white. But on the other hand, in the realm of tints, white is what you have, if think about a piece of paper, when there is an absence of of tint added. So white and black are actually only comprehensible as part of a process that contains both of them. That's the unification of opposites. And if that sounds like it just confuses things when you could just say it's black and white, what the hell? That's the point. The idea is to remove all distinctions to see all things in a very literally confused way as parts of single dynamic processes so that you can become a guru and confuse other people and lead them around. But like I said, quantity into quality and quality into quantity, that's one dialectic. The unification of opposites, seeing them as two parts of a single whole, removing distinctions, that's a second dialectic. And this third dialectic is the negation of the negation, which he just did with that now thing. Okay. He has another more famous version that I'm going to summarize, not from him, but from Marx in a minute, about being an essence, appearance, and concept or form, the notion, which is the theoretical idea, activity, the practical idea, and how this all leads into the absolute. Um, Marx bitches about it. In fact, Marx criticizes not just Hegel for his construction of the negation of the negation, because he says that it's, in fact, theology returning to theology, but he also criticizes Feuerbach's materialist critique of Hegel. So Hegel's, Marx thinks that Hegel created a theology that returns to a theology because you start with the abstract, so that's a theological concept, and you return to a different abstract on a higher level of understanding. He calls it concrete, but it's in fact not concrete. Marx says it's still abstract, and therefore it's theology returning to theology. So Feuerbach follows Hegel, and Feuerbach makes the point that uh, he's a materialist, is that, so he has a, makes the point that Hegel is actually kind of doing this. And so um, Marx actually goes further and takes Feuerbach's materialist reconfiguration of Hegel and criticizes the negation of the negation idea there too. But then in the end, somehow Marx still adopts literally the same program, which is why we just talked about all of this with um, primitive communism and then the productive modes uh, of individual property leading back into global communism. So here's Marx, something from another piece of Marx that uh, I've never read to you before. It's from Marx's general critique of Hegel, which he wrote in 1844. He wrote a lot of things in 1844, by the way. He also wrote the his critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, which is where the opium of the masses line comes from. He also wrote... Um, although he probably wrote that in 1843 and published it in 1844. He also wrote his economic philosophic manuscripts, which I think are some of his most important work in 1844. So anyway, he says, Feuerbach, this is Marx again, Feuerbach is the only one who has a serious critical attitude toward the Hegelian dialectic and who has made genuine discoveries in this field. He is in fact the true conqueror of the old philosophy. The extent of his achievement and the unpretentious simplicity with which he, Feuerbach, gives it to the world stands in striking contrast to the opposite attitude of the others. Feuerbach's great achievement is, one, the proof that philosophy is nothing else but religion rendered into thought and expounded by thought, that is, another form and manner of existence of the estrangement of the essence of man, hence equally to be condemned. So philosophy, according to Marx, following Feuerbach, here is just another way for man to do religion and thus to estrange man from his own essence, which is material. 
and thus is to be condemned alongside religion. Secondly, the establishment of true materialism and of real science by making the social relationship of man to man the basic principle of the theory. And three, his opposing to the negation of the negation, which claims to be the absolute positive, the self-supporting positive, positively based on itself. So here he says that Feuerbach's great contribution is in fact in saying that Hegel was wrong with this negation of the negation nonsense. Which, by the way, is in a sense like do a criticism, do a criticism of the criticism, and somehow you get back to the original thing, but better. Right, Two negatives give you a positive, but in an additive, not a multiplicative sense, apparently. Feuerbach, Marx says, explains the Hegelian dialectic and thereby justifies starting out from the positive facts which we know by the senses as follows. Hegel sets out from the estrangement of substance in logic from the infinite, abstractly universal, from the absolute and fixed abstraction, which means, put popularly, that he sets out from religion and theology. Marx is dead on the nose with this. In fact, the absolute is, um, which is the ultimate abstract uh, for Hegel, and Hegel's goal is to start with the ultimate abstract, negate it in practice in the world, and return back to a fully comprehended uh, absolute. So the absolute abstract, the abstract absolute is going to turn into the concrete absolute, which is the real absolute or the manifested absolute or the immunitized absolute. And so he does start out from theology because the absolute for Hegel is equivalent to God. Secondly, Marx tells us he annuls the infinite and posits the actual sensuous, real finite particular philosophy annulment of religion and theology. Thirdly, he again annuls the positive and restores the abstraction, the infinite restoration of religion and theology. So what Feuerbach, what Marx is saying Feuerbach did with Hegel is said, aha, you're starting out with religion, then you're giving us the material world as a reflection, and then you're just using that to get back to religion. So therefore, you're just a theologian. And Feuerbach was inverting all of this because he was a materialist. In fact, Marx said he wasn't even materialist enough, but he was a materialist. Feuerbach, Marx tells us, thus conceives the negation of the negation only as a contradiction of philosophy with itself, as the philosophy which affirms theology, meaning the transcendent and so on, after having denied it. So you have the transcendent realm where the absolute form lives and then it's denied in the material world which is posited to be an illusion and thus gets transcended only to come back to the transcendent realm in the first place and so marx says uh and which it therefore affirms in opposition to itself saying basically that hegel's negation of the negation is in fact a contradiction it starts with the infinite and it goes into the finite and comes back to the infinite or if you want to say transcendent to material to transcendent so it's wrong but remember marx famously said that he was going to turn hegel on his head so what if it were to start with material and or you know finite or whatever and then went to infinite and then came back down that might work. Ooh, and that's why he ends up keeping the negation of the negation. So the positive position or self-affirmation and self-confirmation contained in the negation of the negation is taken to be a position which is not yet sure of itself. This is Marx bitching still. Which is therefore burdened with its opposite, which is doubtful of itself and therefore in need of proof and which therefore is not a position de demonstrating itself by its existence, not an acknowledged position. Hence it is directly and immediately confronted by the position of sense certainty based on itself. Feuerbach also defines the negation of the negation, the definite concept, as thinking surpassing itself in thinking and as thinking wanting to be direct awareness of nature and reality. But because Hegel has conceived the negation of the negation from the point of view of the positive relation inherent in it as the true and only positive, and from the point of view of the negative relation inherent in it as the only true act and spontaneous activity of all being, 
he has only found the abstract logic, logical speculative expression for the moment for the movement of history which is not yet the real history of man as a given subject but only the act of creation the history of the origin of man so then Marx d isn't happy about this. He's just saying that all Hegel has done is swindle himself into starting with religion to end at religion and then says religion is true. And he calls Hegel's a double error and in fact a lie of his principle. And then this is what Marx has to say going on more about this negation of the negation stuff. He says, in this discussion, all the illusions of speculation are brought together. First of all, consciousness, self-consciousness, is at home in its other being as such. It is therefore, or if we here abstract from the Hegelian abstraction and put the self-consciousness of man instead of self-consciousness, it is at home in its other being as such. This implies, for one thing, that consciousness, knowing is knowing and thinking is thinking, consciousness pretends to be directly the other of itself, to be the world of sense, the real world, life, thought surpassing itself in thought, as Feuerbach said. This aspect is contained herein inasmuch as consciousness as mere consciousness takes offense not at estranged objectivity, but, as, er, but at objectivity as such. Secondly, and I think this is the part I really need to hear, this implies that self-conscious man, insofar as he has recognized and superseded the spiritual world or his world's spiritual general mode of being as self-alienation, nevertheless again confirms it in this alienated shape and passes it off as his true mode of being, reestablishes it and pretends to be at home in his other being as such. Thus, for instance, after superseding religion, after recognizing religion to be a product of self-alienation, he yet finds confirmation of himself in religion as religion. Here is the root of Hegel's false positivism or of his merely apparent criticism. This is what Feuerbach designated as the positing, negating, and reestablishing of religion or theology, but it has to be expressed in more general terms. So Hegel's construction was... We have this abstract idea of the divine. We look for, uh, you know, resolving the various contradictions and so on in ourselves and in our own thought, and we return to a comprehension of the divine. And it's worse than that. Hegel thought we were actually immunitizing the divine by discovering the divine in ourselves. And so Feuerbach saying, "No, you're just doing religion again. What you're doing is no, makes no sense." Marx now says this has to, that Feuerbach's right, but it has to be expressed in even more general terms. He says the reason is at home in unreason as unreason. Sorry, thus reason is at home in unreason as unreason. So there's your whole dialectic of enlightenment by Horkheimer and Adorno. Um, they just, all these people do is rip people off. The man who has recognized that he is leading an alienated life in law, politics, etc., is leading his true human life in this alienated life as such. So when you realize that your political and legal existence is actually alienating you, you are living your true, you are awakening to who you really are, which is being alienated from who you really are. Right, So he's leading his true human life in this alienated life as such. Self-affirmation, self-confirmation, and contradiction with itself and contradiction with both the knowledge of and the essential being of the object is thus true knowledge and life. So there's your Gnostic awakening through realizing your alienation. Both with the knowledge of and with the essential being of... Whoops, sorry. They're there. They're, here we go. Let's try again. There can therefore no longer be any question about an act of accommodation on Hegel's part vis-a-vis -vis religion, the state, etc., since this lie is the lie of his principle. If I know religion as alienated human self-consciousness, then what I know in it as religion is not my self-consciousness, but my alienated self-consciousness confirmed in it. I therefore know my self-consciousness that belongs to itself, to its very nature, confirmed not in religion, but rather anni in annihilated and superseded religion. In Hegel, therefore... The negation of the negation is not the continuation of the true essence affected precisely through negation of the pseudo-essence. With him, the negation of the negation is the confirmation of the pseudo-essence, or of the self-estranged essence in its denial, 
or it is the denial of the pseudoessence as an objective being dwelling outside man and independent of him and its transformation into the subject. A peculiar role, therefore, is played by the act of superseding in which denial and preservation, that there's Alf Haben, right? That is, affirmation are bound together. And so what Marx is actually saying is that this idea of the negation of the negation, starting with the abstract and coming back to the abstract ultimately, which Hegel calls concrete, actually gets it wrong. It should start with the material and it should proceed through material conditions in all forms, just like Feuerbach is recommending. Thus, Marx says, for example, in Hegel's philosophy of law, Civil law is supersede, sorry, sorry super, civil law superseded equals morality. Morality superseded equals the family. The family superseded equals civil society. Civil society superseded equals the state. The state superseded equals world history. In the actual world, civil law, morality, the family, civil society, the state, etc. remain in existence, only they have become moments which means irreducible parts, states of the existence and being of man, which have no validity in isolation, but dissolve and engender one another, etc. They have become moments of motion, moments of the motion of history, technically. In just the same way, quality superseded equals quantity, quantity superseded equals measure, measure superseded equals essence, Essence superseded equals appearance. Appearance superseded equals actuality. Actuality superseded equals the concept. The concept superseded equals objectivity. Objectivity, so there's your objective idea, right? Objectivity superseded equals the absolute idea. The absolute idea superseded equals nature. Nature superseded equals subjective mind. Subjective mind superseded equals ethical objective mind. By the way, that's the stage in which the United Nations and the others are pushing. It's going to be global ethics. So subjective mind superseded equals a ethical objective mind. So they're going to tell us what our ethics are by superseding ethics themselves or our subjective individual minds themselves. Ethical mind superseded equals art. Art superseded equals religion. Religion superseded equals absolute knowledge. And then Marx concludes his criticism by saying, the religious, etc. man can find in Hegel his final confirmation. So Marx's problem with Hegel is not the concept of the negation of the negation, but the concept that the negation of the negation is still doing spiritual work. It's still setting up a religion. He wants it to do, he wants it to describe material transformation, dialectical materialism, not Hegel's weird religion. But that was mostly included for completion. So Marx doesn't only criticize Hegel on this concept, he also explains the positive aspects of Hegel's formulation. So he doesn't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater of this negation or the negation thing. And he then will save that and apply it to his own firm convictions, as we might say, uh, and we call that Marxism today. So supersession, Marx tells us, as an objective movement of retracing the alienation into self. This is the insight expressed within the estrangement concerning the appropriation of the objective essence through the supersession of its estrangement. Remember, tra positive transcendence of private property is human self-estrangement. That's what communism is. It is the estranged insight into the real objectification of man, into the real appropriation of his objective essence through the annihilation of the estranged character of the objective world through the supersession of the objective world in which its estranged mode of being. Sorry, in its estranged mode of being. In the same way, atheism, being the supersession of God, is the advent of the theoretic humanism, and communism, as the supersession of private property, is the vindication of real human life as man's possession, and thus the advent of political, or sorry, practical humanism, where atheism is humanism mediated with itself through the supersession of religion, whilst communism is human humanism mediated with itself through the supersession of private property. Only through the supersession of this mediation, which is itself, however, a necessary premise, does positively self-deriving humanism, positive humanism, come into being. Notice what he's saying here, by the way, is that atheism is not the goal of communism. 
The Soviet unions tried to force people to be atheists. That's 100% true but and didn't succeed at it. But that's not the point. The point is merely to create the opportunity to adopt what Marx called theoretic humanism and then communism as the succession uh, or supersession. So in, in the same way, atheism being the supersession, supersession of God is the advent of theoretic humanism and communism as the supersession of private property is the vindication of real human life as man's possession and thus the advent of practical humanism or atheism is humanism mediated with itself through the supersession of religion, while communism is humanism mediated within itself through the supersession of private property. And so he's not trying to, the goal of communism is not to make atheists. The goal is to transcend religion and transcend private property so that you can be communists. He says, but communism and atheism are no flight no abstraction, no loss of the objective world created by man, of man's essential powers born to the realm of objectivity. They are not a returning in poverty to unnatural primitive simplicity. On the contrary, they are but the first real emergence, the actual realization of man, sorry, first realization for man of man's essence and of his essence as something real. So we're not spiritual beings, we're just people. And we have a world that we live in that we can transform. He says, thus, by grasping the positive meaning of self-referred negation, although again in estranged fashion, Hegel grasps man's self-estrangement, the alienation of man's essence, man's loss of objectivity, and his loss of realness as self-discovery, manifestation of his nature, objectification and realization. In short, within the sphere of abstraction, Hegel conceives Labor as man's act of self-genesis conceives man's relation to himself as an alien being and the manifestation of himself as an alien being to the emergence of the species consciousness and species life. So he doesn't throw out all of Hegel on this negation of the negation thing. I'm just, again, I'm reading this just kind of for, for completeness. I know it's long, but it's good to actually hear where these ideas come from and understand because he has to get to his point through another criticism of Hegel. Because So now he starts with, however. So he just gave Hegel all this due. Hegel really kind of had it. However, apart from, or rather in consequence of, the referral already described, this act appears in Hegel. First, as a merely formal because abstract act, because uh, the human being itself is taken to be only an abstract thinking being conceived merely as self-consciousness. So there's your Cartesian, I think, therefore I am, right? And secondly, because the ex uh, exposition is formal and abstract, the supersession of the alienation becomes a confirmation of the alienation. In other words, you supersede your, your spiritual beliefs only to come back to spiritual beliefs. That's his problem. Or for Hegel, this movement of self-genesis and self-objectification in the form of self-alienation and self-estrangement is the absolute, hence final expression of human life, of life with itself as its aim, of life at peace with itself and in unity with its essence. This movement in its abstract form as dialectic is therefore regarded as truly human life. And because it is nevertheless an abstraction, an estrangement of human life, it is regarded as a divine process, but as the divine process of man, a process traversed by man's abstract, pure, absolute essence that is distinct from himself. Marx is not happy about that. Marx wants man to be the generator of man. Thirdly, this process must have a bearer, a subject, but the subject only comes into being as a result. So Marx puts the subject first because your suffering is what gives you the, uh, your, your awareness, like we said earlier, of your alienation is what gives you the insight to know that you are what you are and that you need to transform the world. This result, he says, the subject knowing itself as absolute self-consciousness is therefore God. That is what Hegel argues. Absolute spirit, the self-knowing and self-manifesting idea Real man and real nature, mere predicates, become mere predicates, symbols of this hidden unreal man, of this unreal nature. Subject and predicate are therefore related to each other in absolute reversal, a mystic subject-object or a uh, subjectivity reaching beyond the object, the absolute subject as a process, the subject alienating itself and returning from alienation into itself, but at the same time retracting this alienation into itself. 
and the subject as this process of pure, incessant revolving within itself. So that's really a confusing statement. But what we have is that, again, Marx is complaining that we're not putting man in his real form first. We're putting it backwards. We're, we're making this, uh, we're, man, is, man isn't the thing that begins, then uh, exerts his subjectivity on the world and thus sees himself in the object that he manipulates or creates. Um, it's the other way around for Hegel. It starts with the, with, with, with the, with this mystical, as he calls it, conception of man and gets it all backwards. So first, Marx tells us, formal and abstract conception of man's act of self-creation or self-objectification, Hegel having positive, posited man as equivalent to self-consciousness, the estranged object, the estranged essential reality of man is nothing but consciousness. So there's his problem with it. The thought of estrangement merely estrangement's abstract and therefore empty and unreal expression negation. This is an impossible sentence. The supersession of the alienation is therefore likewise nothing but an abstract, empty supersession of that empty abstraction, the negation of the negation. The rich, living, sensuous, concrete activity of self-objectification is therefore reduced to its mere abstraction, absolute negativity. See, Marx wants you wallowing in your misery. Hegel wants you focused on the ideal forms. And so Marx is like, he's got it all wrong. Because this so-called negativity is nothing but the abstract, empty form of that real living act, its content can, in consequence, be merely a formal content produced by abstraction from all content. We can go back to that now thing, I think. A result, therefore, one gets general abstract forms of abstraction pertaining to every content and on that account indifferent to and consequently valid for all content. The thought forms or logical categories torn from real mind and from real nature. So isn't this all fun and simple? So what in the world, so that's Marx in 1844 complaining about the way that Hegel set up the negation of the negation. So you'd be under the impression that he's just like, get rid of it. But no, he wanted to appropriate it and turn it inside out. And so I just wanted to give you the critique so you can actually hear it. Here's stupid discussion so you can hear it for yourself. That's sort of all tangential to where we're going with this or what this is about. Because later in 1844, Marx outlined what he is really interested in with regard. And so if all of that didn't make any sense, we're doing okay. It doesn't matter. Marx outlined what he really means by the negation of the negation in his famous economic philosophic manuscripts, which are sometimes called the Paris manuscripts or the 1844 manuscripts. And he does so at the tail end of a rather funny passage. In fact, it's a funny passage that Eric Fogelein uh, led uh, or took is the passage that led Eric Fogelin, I guess is how I should phrase this, to identify Marx as an intellectual swindler who must have known that he was full of crap but sold his ideas anyway. So I'm going to read the longer expression of this. I know you are just dying to have more Marx here, and I'm excited to continue reading to you all this long-winded crap two hours into this. But it's kind of a funny, funny piece. So uh, as far as Marx can be inadvertently funny, so Marx is explaining what it means to be human in the economic philosophic manuscript. And it's obviously not what Hegel, what he was just ripping Hegel for, which is that we're not somehow this divine thing that um, came down to earth and is going to realize that we're divine. That's not what it is, although technically it is. He's going to flip that over, right? And so man creates man is what he's going to explain. And he starts off by laying out the conditions for independence. And this is his, one of his anti-religious screeds. A man, uh, he says, a being only considers himself independent when he stands on his own feet. And he only stands on his own feet when he owes his existence to himself. A man who lives by the grace of another, say God, right, regards himself as a dependent being. But I live completely by the grace of another if I owe him not only the maintenance of my life, but if he has moreover created my life. So this is definitely a shot at God. But not just that, because he hates that the factory owners are owed the maintenance of his life, right? If he is the, so let me read that whole part. But I live completely by the grace of another if I owe him not only the maintenance of my life, but if he has moreover created my life, if he is the source of my life. When it is not of my own creation, my life has necessarily a source of this kind outside it. The creation is, that's capital C creation, meaning the religious creation, the Genesis creation. 
The creation is therefore an idea very difficult to dislodge from popular consciousness. The fact that nature and man exist on their own account is incomprehensible to it because it contradicts everything tangible in practical life. So he's really wanting to get past the creation, and that's a stumbling block for his, you know, man-centered religion. But he's saying that the only way for you to actually be independent, to be liberated, is to cast down all dependence on all other beings to whom you might owe your life. Doesn't that sound like a healthy way to be? He says the creation of the earth has received a mighty blow from Geonosi. That is, from the science which presents the formation of the earth, the development of the earth as a process, as a self-generation. Maybe we should go read some Teilhard de Chardin again soon. And also observe his reliance on the, the, the suffix nosy, geonosy, nosy, like Gnostic, G-N-O-S-Y, geonosy, Gnosticism about the earth. Marx then goes on to say, Generatio equivoca, that is spontaneous generation, is the only practical refutation of the theory of creation. Now, it's certainly easy to say we don't believe in spontaneous generation, by the way. Cre Christians who are creationists do not believe in spontaneous generation. Uh, they believe things were created, and people who uh, are bent on the materialist, uh, or naturalist, I should say, biological evolution, do not believe in spontaneous generation either. They think that the forms of life evolved, although they don't necessarily claim to say how that started. And we're not getting into that debate, because that's a diversion, so don't start it. We're doing marks here. He says, now it is certainly easy to say that the single to the single individual Aristotle has already said, you have been begotten by your father and your mother. Notice what he's doing is tearing down common sense in Aristotle here. Aristotle already said that you have been begotten by your father and your mother. Therefore, in you, the mating of two human beings, a species act of human beings has produced the human being. This is why Marx is going to try to claim that we're a species being because we're produced by species acts. In other words, human reproduction. You see, therefore, that even physically man owes his existence to man. Therefore, you must not only keep sight of the one aspect, the infinite progression, which leads you to further inquire, well, who begot my father, who his grandfather, etc. You must also hold on to the circular movement sensuously perceptible in that progress by which man repeats himself in procreation, man thus always remaining the subject. You will reply, however, I grant you this circular movement, now grant me the progress, which drives me ever further until I asked, who begot the first man in nature as a whole? So let's pause and take, that was a funny way of phrasing all this, let's take stock of where we are. Marx is saying, yeah, okay, so I get it. There's an infinite regress here. I came from my father, my father came from his father, he came from his father, and then you might reply to all this stuff, This he's doing a hypothetical conversation with himself here, you might reply to all this stuff by saying, who begot the first man and who begot nature as a whole? Mark says, I can only answer you. Your question is itself a product of abstraction. This is exactly where um, Eric Fogelin decides that Marx is a swindler. He then says, your question itself is a product of abstraction, so that would have to be negated and then negated again or succeeded. So succession is the negation of the negation, right? So that would have to be negated and then negated again or succeeded. Ask yourself how you arrived at that question. Ask yourself whether your question is not posed from a standpoint to which I cannot reply because it is wrongly put. Ask yourself whether that progress as such exists for a reasonable mind. When you ask about the creation of the na of nature and man, you are abstracting in so doing uh, in so doing from man and nature. When you postulate, so right, it's like the nows, right? This now, that now, all the nows, every now, but now you understand now. Here, what Marx is basically doing is the same little freaking stunt, but he's like, you can't ask who the first man was without having an abstract concept of man. You can't ask where nature came from without having an abstract of nature. So you're just going into the abstractions just like Hegel did. That's 
literally what he's saying. So this is baloney. He says, ask yourself whether that progress as such exists for a reasonable mind. When you ask about the creation of nature, man, you are abstracting in so doing from man and nature. So that's what I'm saying. You postulate them as non-existent because they're abstract, right? But that's actually not what anybody's doing. And yet you want me to prove them to you as existing. Now I say to you, give up your abstraction and you will also give up your question. Or if you want to hold on to your abstraction, then be consistent. And if you think of man and nature as non-existent, then think of yourself as non-existent. For you too are surely nature and man. Don't think, don't ask me, for as soon as you think and ask, your abstraction from the existence of nature and man has no meaning. Or are you such an egotist that you conceive Everything is nothing, and yet want yourself to exist. So that's where Eric Fogelein concludes that Marx is an intellectual swindler. And that's the funny part, because he can't answer the infinite regression question, and flips out and says, don't ask the question, and then calls the hypothetical questioner a name. You're an egotist. You, you exist, therefore, obviously, you exist. Don't ask me questions about where everything came from even though literally it's in the midst of a discussion of where everything came from, which is that man begot man and became man through the historical processes that made man into man. Marx continues, you can reply, I do not want to postulate the nothingness of nature, etc. I want to ask you about its genesis, just as I ask uh, the anatomist about the formation of bones, etc. Marx is about to flip out again. Marx says, but for the socialist man... The entire so-called history of the world is nothing but the creation of man through human labor. Nothing but the emergence of nature for man. So he has the visible, irrefutable proof of his birth through himself of his genesis. Since the real existence of man and nature has become evident in practice through sense experience because man has thus become evident for man as the being of nature and nature for man as the being of man the question about an alien being that's god by the way about a being above nature and man a question which that's the gnostic conception of god by the way is that he's an alien being a question which implies the admission of the universality of nature and man has become impossible in practice Atheism as the denial, and this is the this is the punchline. All that was the fun part, and this is the punchline. Atheism as the denial of this unreality has no longer any meaning, for atheism is a negation of God and postulates the existence of man through this negation. But socialism as socialism no longer stands in any need of such a mediation. It proceeds from the theoretically and practi practically sensuous consciousness of man, that means real-world consciousness of man, through the senses, and of nature as the essence. Socialism is man's positive self-consciousness, no longer mediated through the abolition of religion, just as real life is man's positive reality, no longer mediated through the abolition of private property, through communism. Communism is the position as the negation of the negation. Pause. Of what? Communism is the position of the negation of the negation of two things. God and private property. Communism is the position as the negation of the negation of God. Atheism is the negation of God. And socialism, theoretically and practically sensuous consciousness of man, that socialism or communism is the negation of the negation of belief in God. So when, how, how does that work? Why is that it? Because when you believe in God, you are unable, this is his opium of the masses argument, you are unable to perceive the sources of your suffering because you've been numbed to them through your faith. So you are no longer, you're not able, you're imposed by this alien being imposed upon so that you can't understand the nature, the true nature of your suffering. And because you don't understand the true nature of your suffering, you'll never do anything to change it or end it. And when you decide that you're experiencing your real misery in life, then you will decide, no, I don't need to pray about it. I need to do something about it. And when you decide to go do something about it, what you'll realize is that it was never God. It was us together, socially, working one for another that makes it all work. 
and then you arrive at socialism. So the negation of the negation of belief in God is socialism. And he says it right there. And the abolition of religion and the abolition of private property together form communism. And communism is the position as the negation of the negation, and is hence the actual phase necessary for the next stage of historical development in the process of human emancipation and rehabilitation. It's not that we're just going to free ourselves from our um, fallen state or our estranged state or our alienation or our exploitation or our expropriation. We're not just going to free ourselves human emancipation from that. We're going to have human rehabilitation. We're going to remember who we really are, which is that we're socialists. We're communists at heart. And Marx finishes this passage by saying communism is the necessary form and the dynamic principle of the immediate future, but communism as such is not the goal of human development, the form of human society. So communism itself is also just a stepping stone to a complete liberation. But here's what we get to take away. Communism is the real negation of the negation in Marxism. It's absolute, it's, it's primitive communism as a model of the ideal society gets negated by productive forms that involve property that gets individual property, I guess, that gets negated again into communism. Communism is the negation of the negation. So it is uh, the succession uh, of, of human history is communism. So communism is literally a successor religion. I used to give Wes Yang uh, shit for calling woke successor ideology, but it turns out here it is rooted for real in Marxist lingo. Um, atheism, Marx gave us, is the negation of religion, and communism is the successor of the negation of religion. So it is the negation of that negation. And socialism or socialist consciousness as a faith is therefore the successor of religion through dialectical negation. That's why Antonio Gramsci famously said that socialism is precisely the religion that must overwhelm Christianity. And this is Marx at his religious, but um, it's also Marx in his more practical uh, global communist vision, right? And so in that practical vision, we just heard in Capital earlier in the podcast that uh, communism is the negation of the negation of primitive communism. So tribal communism goes through productive phases uh, and then returns to global communism. And um, what we heard in Capital really puts it together and leads us back to where we started it, the China model and the ESG mirror of the China model. We could basically call them both the China model because they both benefit China. Uh, how about that? ESG is designed to benefit China. And the China model, the Deng Xiaoping theory, is designed to benefit China. And in fact, they work exactly the same way, to benefit China. How about that? Um, just to, to drag it back to capital, though, Marx narrowed it right down for us. The microcosm within the microcosm, or macrocosm, I mean. Um, capitalism expropriated those huge landowners and the huge, uh, and all the small proprietors. Sorry, ex I did that backwards. Capitalism expropriated all of the uh, small proprietors, and then socialism will expropriate the huge owners uh, as the negation of the negation to lead us on the primrose path to communism. And that's exactly what Marx said, is that socialism is going to expropriate the expropriators. So back to that passage from capitalism, let's look at it again. Along with the constantly diminishing numbers of of the magnets of capital who usurp and monopolize all advantages of this process of transformation grows the mass of misery, oppression, slavery, degradation, exploitation. And imagine if you got your religion out of the way, you'd have no way to cope with that, so you'd become revolutionary, radicalized. But with this too grows the revolt of the working class, a class always increasing in numbers and disciplined, united, organized by the very mechanism of the process of capitalist production itself. The monopoly of capital becomes a fetter upon the mode of production which has sprung up and flourished along with and under it. Centralization of the means of production and socialization of labor at last reach a point where they become incompatible with their capitalist integument. This integument is burst asunder. The knell of capitalist private property sounds. The expropriators are expropriated. So that's how you're going to get there. That's a re revolution. The key observation to make here is that the form of monopoly capital will come into being and then will be co-opted by the workers. That's Marx's vision. He could have written this down in a lot fewer than 500 fucking pages. 
Mark says that this will be necessarily a violent process, but it will be less violent and less protracted than the emergence of capitalism beating down all the small artisan feudal producers. Um, and that monopoly capital thing is very important for our time because as we continue to move more and more toward monopoly capital, that's what they're seizing. You'll notice that communists tend to seize monopoly power and they tend to seize choke points. And that's exactly what we're seeing happen. So turning back to capital, remember Marx says that socialism is the negation of the negation, which is the rise of capitalism from the earlier form of productive forces then being negated. And that socialism, in fact, as the negation of the negation, rests atop the productivity of those early phases without negating their essential form. In other words, we've got to have the corporate organization as a basis of the, product, the, the rise of productive forces in order to have something for socialists to work with so that it doesn't turn into a primitive mud hut, which is what it does in practice, which is what Marx says is crude communism and what it leads to. Okay, So we're supposed to have an uplifted or succeeded or superseded communism that will be national and global and will have a high level of production even though nobody uh, has to work or something. And the money phrasing, again, we'll return to that and then we'll close up here. The capitalist mode of appropriation, the result of the capitalist mode of production, produces capitalist private property. This is the first negation of individual private property as founded on the labor of the proprietor. But capitalist production begets with the inexorability of a law of nature its own negation. It is the negation of the negation. This does not reestablish private property for the producer, but gives him individual property based on the acquisition of the capitalist era. Based on the acquisition of the capitalist era, that is, on cooperation and the possession in common of the land and the means of production. So what I just said is borne out. This does not reestablish private property for the producer, but gives him individual property based on the acquisition of the capital series. You're not going back to private property ownership as we go through this transition. We're going to have individual property, which means stuff that you can have access to, but that's common, communally owned. And it's going to be based on the acquisition. I think that's a fancy word for theft of that which was produced in the capitalist era. Um, and Marx, of course, believed, as we can see, that the full expression of the capitalist era is, in fact, monopoly capital that then, through its own internal contradiction and its own form having become socialized production, can easily be transformed into state capital through the expropriation of the expropriators. As it turns out, forcing communism in the 20th century didn't work because it was going up against capital rather than recognizing that capital has to be usurped. It has to be, the transformation has to be done on the acquisition of capitalism. That's what he said, right? The, the acquisition of the capitalist era is what it has to be built upon, which means for socialism to work, it has to acquire monopoly capital power. They tried to force that in these situations like in Soviet Union and People's Republic of China into a feudal society that didn't have forces of production in an in industrial sense. And so they tried to build those forces of production on a communist or socialist theory, and it didn't work out. They think they're in a different position now. Now they have this 20th century made the world rich. You have a fascist production model running in China. You have an increasingly fascist production model still operating the West, but bringing it down so that China can rise. And um, the future program is going to be built on the acquisitions of the capitalist era this time, not on feudal backwards things. Very different. And that's why it's going to require, like we started at the beginning with a social credit system in order to manage social governance and the socialist market economy, aka Dengist system. Now, nearly all of the commentary I've ever heard on this key passage of Marx in Capital that we've talked about here um, usually it references his thoughts about the negation of the negation and focuses on the emergence of, of individual property and whatever individual property might refer to. Uh, for example, if you go back and listen to my podcast I did about Kohei Saito and degrowth, um, from Marx and the Anthropocene, the, that entire discussion is really about what individual property looks like in a commonwealth, where commonwealth doesn't mean like Virginia. It means like literally everything is held in common. All the wealth is owned in common. 
Um, so I've seen very little commentary. My point being, I've, very, I've seen very little commentary talking specifically about that last clause, that key clarifying clause, that this is all going to be based on cooperation and the possession in common of the land and the means of production. And again, I remind you the Dungist system, Deng Xiaoping theory, is one country, two systems. The systems are communist and fascist, and the um, rather explicitly so, and that the way that it works is that people are free to pursue private interests and become wealthy, aka individual property, but all of the land, all of the raw materials, and the heavy capital are owned in common by the CCP. So the means of production and the land are owned in common by the CCP, but people are allowed to pursue their own private interests through that. So now we can talk about some real negations of the negation so that we can get to the negation of the negation of the negation, I guess, or the successor of the successor, uh, or that which supersedes 20th century communism and leads us into 21st century communism, just to throw all around all of our buzzwords. So for a century or so, we've forced the socialist experiment in various places, and we can say with some clarity how things work out. Uh, there are feudal attempts and there are capitalist attempts, both being put under attack by communists. So in backwards feudal societies like Russia and China, backwards being the Soviet word for it, by the way, um, when they are negated by communism, by a violent vanguard revolution, which seems to be the only thing that works, and forced into what they called actually existing socialism, that bureaucratized very quickly. It actually had strong fascistic totalitarian elements, and then eventually it all collapses. Um, the negation of the negation of feudal societies through communist praxis is societal collapse of the productive forces, which then has to build back better, I suppose, is the phrase. Um, so what is the negation of the negation of a feudal state by Marxist praxis? It's a failed state in economic desperation controlled by a cartel-like oligarchy. Uh, it's actually usually a kleptocracy of either state or business interests that managed to cleave onto power in that collapsing transition. Capitalist societies usually don't succeed in being negated by socialist praxis or by socialism at all because the business world basically rejects it and it never gets off the ground. It's also very unpopular with free people to try to steal their freedom for a pipe dream, especially when they can see around the world that it's causing the deaths of hundreds of millions of people. Well, I should say deaths and suffering and, and uh, destruction of hundreds of millions of lives. So if the socialist attack in a capitalist country is, is sufficiently threatening, what has happened is that there generates a giant reaction. And it's commonly come to believe when it's sufficiently organized communist takeover that there's only one way to stop it, which is by turning to fascism, which can organize people like a bundle of sticks to fight back against the lockstep vision of the completely zealous and, and insane communists. Um, and of course, modern Western nations right now are getting their test on this. So the negation of the negation of a capitalist state by Marxist praxis ends up not to be communism, as Marx predicted, but rather fascism. Fascism is what you get. Unless, of course, we're just able to successfully repel the Marxist praxis in the first place. If we, if we can keep our society, a republic can be kept. Don't lose hope. But Marx, therefore, didn't quite have it, although we heard in Capital where this is going to go. The negation of the negation of capitalism is not socialism that leads to communism. It is socialistic parasitism that triggers fascism. Fascism is the negation of the negation of a capitalist society. Let me say that again in case the people in the back missed it. Fascism is the negation of the negation of a capitalist society. So communists always go and rescue Marx from himself by bringing him back in in some new light and focusing on some other one line or another line, kind of like how um, Lenin believed he cracked the code of what Marx and Engels truly meant by developing his vanguard model, and Kohei Saito believes that he figured out what Marx really meant by developing degrowth. Well, Lenin's vanguard model, I guess, um, worked in the context that it worked, but it required figuring out a theory of productive forces that he could never figure out how to unleash. And that's where we get the collapse of China and the rise of the, the China model. Um, Mao's China collapses through the Cultural Revolution in the end, really at the Great Leap Forward, and then through the Cultural Revolution again, uh, very badly. Deng Xiaoping enters into this chaos, as we discussed at the beginning, 
and you end up with a fascistic integrated Potemkin market that they call socialist market economy, a total oxymoron. And that is the China model, and that is the negation of the negation of the negation. Absolute calamity was the negation of Maoist socialism. Feudalism was negated by socialism. Socialism was negated in destruction and collapse. And Deng Xiaoping does a negation of the negation of the negation with the help of the United States State Department, Henry Kissinger, uh, Brzezinski, Rockefeller, David Rockefeller, and uh, some other Chinese fellows like T.H. Chan. And that model, the China model, is the negation of the negation of the negation. Right? Desperation is what allowed it to happen. Deng Xiaoping was desperate to rebuild his country, to build back better, and he rebuilt He rebuilt with a fascist model without ever abandoning the theoretical idea of communism. One country, two systems. Open up. Let there be a market, but the market will... The CCP... Sorry, the market will be controlled by the CCP because the CCP will own and control all land, all raw materials, all heavy capital. Private interests can run whatever fascist corporatist model they want on this state-owned capital to the glory of socialism as Deng Xiaoping had it, and they can get as rich as they want so that they might have what it takes to unleash the productive forces and build China back better. And so what you end up with in this successor model or superseded model is a fascist economy that maintains the basic spirit of communism, or in other words, you have the practical idea being the fascist economy and the theoretical idea being the basic spirit of communism, that's the way Deng Xiaoping phrased it, with all centralized power located in the PRC, uh, and the the CCP being its, uh, its, its head running a democratic centralism. Again, Deng called this socialism with Chinese characteristics, but it is in fact communism with fascistic characteristics. And the negation of the negation of the negation of feudalism, therefore, was the China model under Deng Xiaoping theory, which has been advanced since through Xi Jinping theory, which is similar, but with even more social control and a tighter grip on the corporate environment combined with the exploitative positioning in the global manufacturing trade and a social credit system to make sure that this power can't be challenged and that his population is compliant. We'll just remind you the money phrase from Marx said, the capitalist mode of appropriation, the result of the capitalist mode of production, produces capitalist private property. This is the first negation of individual private property is founded on the labor of the proprietor. But capitalist production begets with the inexorability of of a law of nature its own negation. It is the negation of the negation. It does not reestablish private property for the producer but it gives him individual property based on the acquisition of the capitalist era that is on cooperation and the possession in common of the land and of the means of production, a.k.a. Deng Xiaoping theory. This is Deng Xiaoping theory in practice. It does not say possession in common of the products of production, merely the means of production. This allows productive forces to be unleashed through fascist production models, and Deng Xiaoping's hybrid model is the successor model to Maoist communism. Socialism with Chinese characteristics succeeds Maoist communism by incorporating fascism as its economic engine. And ESG does exactly the same thing in reverse because it's attacking a successful, productive, prolific capitalist economy. It puts a bridle on capitalism in the name of sustainability and inclusion. That's where Marcuse's arguments from One Dimensional Man and the Essay on Liberation came in that we talked about before. So um, An important point, though, when we talk about Marcuse is that Marcuse realized that in the West, in capitalist societies, one of the forces that we have to deal with in capitalist culture, so to speak, is that the working class is stabilized and conservative and counter-revolutionary. They don't want a revolution. So now you have in the West the ability to say, you know what, we can have a communism that no longer tokenizes the worker and therefore has to pretend that it hates corporations. China was in desperate straits and it could claim a gigantic humanitarian win by building out a market. And in fact, it raised a billion people out of poverty while imperiling the entire world. But nevertheless, they could claim a gigantic win. Here in the West, we had the problem. Communists had the problem, I should say. Actually, we didn't. Communists had the problem that they can't abandon the working class to whom they built, around whom they built everything that Marx has written, everything. And... Marcuse's like, no, they're stabilized. We can move on. We need a new working class, he said, a new proletariat. So he imports 
Maoist identity politics in American identity categories, cultural identity categories, to form a new proletariat. And there you get the basis of your S score for ESG. The G score is ultimately the most important score because it allows a Soviet a stakeholder Soviet model to design how corporations are going to be run, and in particular that they're going to implement the social justice program that is American Maoism. The whole program of ESG operates like an organized cartel environment for doing business with state support that is coordinated and facilitated under what's called the public-private partnership model or stakeholder capitalism, which I told you already is stakeholder Sovietism, which is da da economic fascism that's operating now not beneath the state but above the state and controlling the state pulling the strings of the so-called deep state and it forces the implementation of the environmental and social requirements to achieve degrowth which is the inverse or negation of capitalism so that we can end up with a fascism with communist characteristics so the negation of the negation of the negation of our capitalist society is sustainable and inclusive capitalism, which is a capitalism sort of, it's a fascism really, bridled by a stakeholder Soviet, comprised of so-called uh, managers and so-called experts, just as Lenin intended the vanguard to be, who owe nothing to the stabilized and now conservative working class. But this is the same model that you have run by the CCP in China, with the single inversion that the state is not yet on top. But the UN really, as a um, will be, would be, wants to be, global government is actually on top because ESG is all designed to service the United Nations and its sustainable development agenda. This is the successor or supersessor, if you want, of capitalism. A bridled fascist corporate environment run by a financial cartel that's implementing communism for the masses, but definitely not for the oligarchs, and handing the torch to the largest communist country in history. So in summary, Marx called communism the riddle of history solved, and it knows itself to be the solution. He also called it the negation of the negation. That solution is the negation of the negation of the negation, I should say, of the 20th century modes. The negation of both actually existing socialism and fascism into a single totalitarian system that annuls yet keeps the essential characteristics of both failed systems. So in other words, the supersession of communism and capitalism both the supersession of industrialization, to use that language, is communism 3.0, a corporatist communism, 21st century communism, and it is the successor of the model of 20th century industrial and state communism and its capital, uh, capitalist rivals in the West. That's the world that we live in today. That is what is being built, and yes, indeed, it is communist. Communism 3.0, 21st century communism, which is Marxist succession through the China model, which accords exactly with what Marx said the negation of the negation would be in capital near the very end, as we read. So in China, they've built the new model of communism. In the West, with ESG, we copy the new model of communism. And so the last stage before its final negation will be that these two systems are separate and different and competing. In the end, they will merge and we will have one global communist system. But the problem is, besides all the tyranny, all the death, all the control, the social credit system, the complete lack of freedom, the eventual grinding down, is that Communism only works when it can steal from other places. It cannot actually produce. Productive socialism in China does not exist. Not really. China thrives not because of its ability to marshal productive forces, but because of its ability to generate huge savings in production costs and a huge consumer market, and basically the Henry Ford model, 
uh, is what's being played out there um, for Western corporations and is bleeding Western nations, rich Western nations dry to do it. Meanwhile, figuring out ways which it could be sustained for a while on this to exploit the world to steal all of its material resources. The question is, is what happens when it's one global system? Can they still do that? Well, they believe that they can and that they will, and I believe that they can't and that billions will die. But of course, that's likely to be part of the problem or program, because think back to what Mark Cruz has said, as I, uh, as I told you, in One Dimensional Man in chapter 9 near the end, where he says, of course, this free society that he envisions will require a reduction in the future population of the world. And he wrote that when the population of the world was about 3.4 billion people, less than half of what it is today. So they need fewer of us to make their sustainable economy work in the long run. And it's very concerning. That's not the point. We're not going to digress. We'll finish. What's happening in the world today is communism. It's unabashedly communism. It's obviously communism. It's communism if you look at what's happening with eyes that can see and ears that can hear. It's communism if you read the key phrases from Karl Marx about what communism is meant to be. That's the world that we live in. That's the thing that's happening. We're in the midst of a global communist revolution and we'd better wake up and we'd better stop it.